Good evening. I call the regular meeting of the Ames City Council for Tuesday, April 25th to order. And it's my pleasure to start out with some proclamations and then some exciting presentation of Historic Preservation Awards. Let's see, is Gabriel and Dave and Diana here? Please come up. Gabby? Hi. Arbor Day. Whereas in 1872, Sterling Morton proposed to the Nebraska Board of Agriculture that a special day be set aside for the planting of trees and whereas this holiday called Arbor Day is now observed throughout the nation and the world and whereas trees can reduce the wind erosion of our topsoil, cut heating and cooling costs, moderate the temperature, clean the air, produce oxygen and provide a habitat for wildlife and whereas trees are renewable resources that increase property values, enhance the economic vitality of the business area, and beautify our community, therefore I, John A. Hala, Mayor of the City of Ames, Iowa, do hereby proclaim this Friday, April 28th, 2023, is Arbor Day in Ames. I encourage residents to plant a tree, mulch existing trees, and protect our trees and woodlands by becoming good stewards of the land. There will be an Arbor Day planting at Ames Municipal Cemetery this Friday, 10 a.m. Also, Ames residents can receive a rebate for planting a native tree on their property or in the adjacent right-of-way. Information can be found on the City of Ames website in the Smart Watersheds and Rebate area. And we have some representatives from Ames Trees Forever, and we have our forester here and our director of Parks and Recreation. So who's going to start us off? Gabby, you going to start us? Or? All right. And... Uh, Maybe you can introduce yourself too. You're just uh, one of our... Still relatively new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So um, as Mayor Hala said, my name is Gabby Edwards. I am the city forester here in Ames. Um, he jokes that I'm new. I actually started in August. Um, so I'm new-ish. I feel like I could get the ish on now. New-ish. <laughs> almost a year. Um, so Arbor Day is a celebration that... Uh, that communities and states recognize every year. Um, it's usually the last Friday in April. Um, it was started in Nebraska. Last year was the 150th anniversary of Arbor Day. So we're in 151 years now. Um, Ames has been recognized as a Tree City USA. We, that's kind of in tandem with Arbor Day. And we actually were just recognized for our 39th straight year as a Tree City USA. What that designates is, is that we have uh, city staff dedicated to caring and managing trees. We have a line item in our budget for managing and planting trees, tree ordinance, um, and then a few other kind of miscellaneous things. So we're excited to be able to achieve that again this year. And we invite everyone out to the Ames Municipal Cemetery. We built a new pavilion out there um, by the columbariums right by the cemetery office. And we'll be planting a variety of trees and shrubs uh, throughout the morning, Friday, this Friday at 10 a.m. if you're welcome to join us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Oh, you want a picture? Sure. Okay. Oh. Come back. <laughs> I failed to mention. So, hold on one second. I failed, I failed to mention that we have representatives here from Ames Trees Forever. Ames Trees Forever did donate $1,000 towards our planting that we'll be doing um, on Friday at, for the Arbor Day celebration. So thank you, Ames Trees Forever, for that donation. All right, invite Susan to come up. We're going to have Historic Preservation Month next. Whereas historic preservation is an effective tool for managing growth and sustaining development, revitalizing neighborhoods, fostering local pride, and maintaining community character while enhancing livability. And whereas historic preservation is relevant for communities across the nation, 
both urban and rural, and for Americans of all ages, all walks of life, and all ethnic backgrounds. And whereas historic preservation is inherently economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable, fostering a culture of reuse and maximizing the life cycle of all resources through conservation, and whereas it is important to celebrate the role of history in our lives and contributions made by dedicated individuals in helping to preserve tangible aspects of the heritage that has shaped the Ames community and us as people. Therefore, I, John A. Halen, Mayor of the City of Ames, Iowa, do hereby recognize May 2023 as National Historic Preservation Month and proclaim the month of May 2023 as Ames Historic Preservation Month and call upon the people of Ames to join their fellow citizens across the United States in recognizing this special observance. And introduce Susan Manks, our Historic Preservation <laughs> On uh, commission, do you have any comments you want to make? No, I'm not. <laughs> <We've got laughs> All right, awards coming up next. that's right. We have awards coming up in a, in a few minutes. So, All right. Sheila, you want to come up? We have an additional proclamation to make from National Library Week. Whereas libraries provide the opportunity for everyone to pursue their passions and engage in lifelong learning and to live their best life. And whereas libraries have long served trusted institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. Whereas libraries strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve and ensure equity of access for all. And whereas libraries adapt to their ever-changing needs of their communities, continually expanding their collections, services, and partnerships. And whereas libraries play a critical role in the economic vitality of communities by providing internet and technology access, literary, literary skills, <clears throat> and support for job seekers, small businesses, and entrepreneurs. And whereas libraries, librarians, and library workers are joining library supporters and advocates across the nation to celebrate National Library Week. Therefore, I, John A. Hale, Mayor of the City of Ames, Iowa, to hereby proclaim National Library Week, April 23rd through 29th, 2023. During this week, I encourage all residents to visit the library to explore the wealth of resources available. And it's my pleasure to introduce Sheila, our director, to uh, make a few comments. Thank you so much. This is National Library Week, an exciting time at libraries all across the country um, at your Ames Public Library. This happens to be a really busy April and a very busy week, so I encourage you to check out the programs happening. We do have a special thing going on where um, we have a scavenger hunt where you can go around the library and look for bright yellow light bulbs, and those indicate our novel ideas, and that's a special um, ideas or service improvements or new collections that were initiated by our staff in response to needs they observed. So you can go around and find those and see all the creative, um, responsive programs and services we have for you and um, turn in your scavenger hunt and get a little surprise. So that's just one way to celebrate. Um, we're very appreciative of our community. The Ames community is so supportive of its library, as is the city council. And thank you for that. We appreciate it. All right, Susan, you want to join me again? We're going to just please tonight to uh, recognize four different um, historic preservation awards. Ray, you're ready to go. These are the ones right Before we announce the first winner, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. The Ames Historic Preservation Commission's Preservation Award Program annually recognizes historic preservation activities within the city of Ames. The intent of the awards program is to highlight and honor those efforts and to promote and encourage future preservation efforts throughout the community. The four preservation projects being recognized this evening represent improvements to both residential and downtown commercial buildings and properties. And uh, I'm going to ask 
Jerry and Mary Nelson to come up as the first award recipient, and uh, we'll uh, recognize um, you. We'll, I have to read this thing first before I get in the plaque. All right. <laughs> All right, Jerry and Mary Nelson, this is our category, Renewing the Past Award, Rehabilitation for 2023. We recognize Jerry and Mary Nelson for rehabbing the commercial building at 330 412 Burnett Avenue and 335th Street. The award for renewing the past award, rehabilitation, acknowledges the need to alter or add to a historic property to meet continuing or changing uses while preserving those portions or features which convey a building's historical, cultural, or architectural value. Rehabilitation encourages the continued use of a building for its original purpose or its adaptive reuse to accommodate a new function. The recent rehabilitation of the two buildings includes the addition of a new exterior elements, significant original features remain that convey the historic, cultural, and architectural significance of the original design. The rehabilitation project included removal of non-historic materials, new infill on the main corner entry wall, painting of all exterior walls and infilled openings, repairing parapet walls and the corner pier, and adding exterior flat panels on the upper facade walls. Retention of the corner entry, the flat roof with parapet, infilled openings, and brick cladded exterior walls contribute to the building's ability to reflect its original historic use as an auto service business. New materials on the diagonal entry and the addition of rectangular flat panels on the upper facade are compatible with the original design and they do not damage, destroy, or obscure the significant historic features of the building. Congratulations to Jerry and Mary for your outstanding work and award in historic rehabilitation. All right, our second award is in the category Architecturally Compatible New Additions or Structures for 2023. Jason? This is recognized, this is given to Carly Hermanson. This is not Carly, this is her architect. <laughs> of the architecturally compatible accessory structure detached garage in the old historic, I'm sorry, old town historic district at 712 Douglas Avenue. The award for architecturally compatible new additions or structures recognizes new construction that's architecturally compatible with and sympathetic to historic structures in the vicinity. This includes sensitive infill within historic districts. Details of the new detached garage enhances its appearance and adds to the charm of the neighborhood. The property owner, together with the architect, Jason Dietzenbach of AVEC Design, Build, and Ames, were able to accomplish this while conforming to Chapter 31, Historic Preservation of the Ames Municipal Code, and improving the usefulness of the new structure by sizing it for modern car sizes. The garage is not an exact replica of the original structure. However, it was designed to reflect, replicate the American four square hip cottage architectural style of the house. Design elements of the house used in the detached garage include lap siding, trim proportions, window style and proportions and the hipped roof style. Alternative materials present, permitted by the design guidelines found in chapter 31 were utilized including concrete based siding, asphalt shingles, aluminum clad wood windows and steel doors. To accommodate modern usage of the new garage, dimensions for the width and depth of the overall footprint were increased from that of the original structure. Congratulations to Carly Hermanson for the construction of a new garage compatible with historic structures in Old Town. And it's our pleasure to present this to Jason Dietzenbach, who is the architect for the project. Christy Collins here, you come forward. <coughs> Next is the category of Crown Jewel of Ames Award Restoration for 2023. I'd like to recognize Dennis Jones, who's deceased, represented by Christy Collins and, hey, Alice, your wife? 
Alex Faith with Main Street. Yes, yeah, well, duh. Make the connection here in a second. <laughs> This is, this is presented to Dennis Jones, who's deceased, for restoration of the, AIM, of the former Ames Pantorum building at 410 Douglas Avenue. The award for the crown jewel of Ames <clears throat> restoration accurately depicts the form, features, and character of a property at a particular period of time in its history, while removing evidence of the other periods and reconstruction of missing features. This award is reserved for substantial projects with significant visual impacts. In 2010, Janice Jones purchased the iconic Ames Pantorum building at 410 Douglas Avenue. He loved the Ames Pantorum building and hoped to combine it with his other love, bicycles, <clears throat> by opening his own bike shop. Slowly, he restored the building back to the former glory and during that time rented the building to KHOI Community Radio Station. Dennis had, miss, had missing windows replaced, electrical and HVAC systems updated, and a long south wall padded out and insulated for efficiency. The biggest change was restoring the front window display. In the 1990s, the transom windows were boarded up, storefront windows were shortened, and plywood was used to fill the gap. He removed all of that and installed new windows that matched the original look of the building. The 1960s stationary awning was removed with a, and a new roll-up awning installed in its place to match the one that was on the building in the 1930s. Unfortunately, Dennis passed away in 2018 after a multi-year battle with cancer. Dennis's dream of opening a bike shop was never realized. However, his desire that the Ames Pantorum building be owned by the Ames History Museum is now a reality. Dennis's wife, Cindy, finished projects that were underway, such as replacing first floor windows on the south side. After finishing these projects, Cindy approached the Ames History Museum to inquire if they were interested in purchasing the building. The timing was perfect because the museum was exploring expansion options. The Ames History Museum is thankful for the Joneses' dedication to the Ames Pantorum building. The Ames History Museum hopes to honor Dennis by completing the restoration, including the 1937 neon sign, one of Dennis's, I might add mine and probably the community's, favorite elements of the building. Dennis's passion for the iconic Ames Pantorum building and his wishes to get it into the hands of the Ames History Museum to finish restoration will be an asset to our historic downtown for decades to come. Congratulations to the Jones family for Dennis Jonas's efforts to preserve a crown jewel of downtown Ames. And I invite James Wilcox up. Oh. This is our fourth and final award tonight. Also in the category of Crown Jewel of Ames Restoration. I can recognize James Wilcox for restoration of the front porch on his home in the Old Town Historic District at 329th Street. The award for Crown Jewel of, J of Ames Award accurately depicts the form, features, and character of a property of a particular period of time in its history while removing evidence of other periods and reconstruction of missing features. This award is reserved for substantial projects within, with significant visual impacts. James's house at 329th Street is a single family residence in the Old Town Historic District. According to city assessor records, the house was built in 1910. The original front porch was removed sometime in 1926. While no photographs of the original house exist, the 1926 Sanborn map proves the existence of a full-length porch across the north facade of the house facing 9th Street. James Wilcox, homeowner, set out to reconstruct a porch with the original dimensions of 7 feet deep and 38 feet in length. The proposed balustrade combined wood-turned balusters, a shaped railing, and square columns. Additionally, Wilson used reclaimed brick to face the concrete piers and skirted the front porch with painted lattice. This restrained design is not overly ornate, but consistent with the detailing common to the vernacular Queen Anne style. Congratulations to Jim Wilcox for enhancing our Old Town Historic District and your 2023 award in historic restoration.
All right, we'll move on to our uh, consent agenda. Council, does anyone want to pull any item from consent this evening? Hearing none, I entertain a motion to approve consent. Move consent. Second. Thank you. Moved and seconded. And uh, as you're aware, uh, Councilwoman Corey is on the phone. So, all right, roll call. Fletcher? Aye. Barton? Aye. Rollins? Aye. Go ahead and move on. Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right, moving on to public forum. This is a time we set aside for comments from the public on topics of city business other than those listed on the agenda. And uh, understand the council will not take any action on comments. Um, and I uh, would ask people to limit their comments to three minutes or less. Is there anyone that wants to address council? Grant, introduce yourself and you may begin. Good evening, Grant Olson, 3812 Ontario Street. I stood at this lectern last year and said, hey, coming up, South 16th and Duff project coming up, going to be disruptions, especially to those that use the bike and pedestrian path in that area. And I noticed that at the beginning of this month, uh, there was no way to cross north and south. So for example, if you're someone who lives in the Cape Mitchell neighborhood and you work at Hickory Park, and you work in the evening shift, maybe 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, you do have the option to say, take uh, Cyride's yellow route and get to work. But unfortunately, uh, yellow route service ends. Uh, I think that last southbound bus is about 6.50 here, you know, just a little bit. So as far as a way to get home back to the Cape Mitchell neighborhood, you're, uh, you're kind of out of luck. And um, there've been actually some uh, real world examples. Uh, I invite you to call out to the local Salvation Army service office and talk with Kathy Pinkerton. And she can re relay to you some stories about people who have had to walk to their jobs there in that old Chicago restaurant and those motels nearby and the struggles that people are having to safely navigate to and from work. And so I'm just uh, concerned um, actually more frustrated than anything. I mean, the, the city has resources uh, available to it. Um, when the notice about the construction went out, it said, well, just be advised and bicyclists and pedestrians can detour. For example, if you do are on one side and you wanna go to the other side, uh, you have to go because, well, at the same time, and I don't know if it's finished yet, but there was uh, work on the ramps at South 16th and Grand. So you had that additional barrier as well. So you have to go up to South 5th around to Vet Med Trail. And at one time there was work on Vet Med Trail and down to Airport Road and then into the <coughs> Cape Mitchell neighborhood. And so that's a, an additional three and a half mile detour for people. Just give you a little equivalent. That'd be like going from Metacap at Lincoln and Duff out to Lincoln and Dakota. Uh, I invite Public Works to call Cyride, uh, talk about maybe brainstorm some resources that are available. 
Um, I've ridden the on-demand service that Sirite offers in the east third of town, and I, I would see it just as changing where the bus can travel. And this would just be a temporary situation until South 16th and Duff can uh, resolve the construction. So thank you. Thanks, Grant. Anybody else? <coughs> Seeing none, we'll close public forum and move on to item number 30, Cyclone Welcome Weekend. Good evening. Uh, these are items 30A and 30B, and they're very much related because it's all about Cyclone Welcome Weekend. So 30A, we'll start with that one. Uh, last year in July, the city council approved an ordinance to allow enhanced penalties for nuisance parties uh, when authorized by city council for determined dates and times. Uh, tonight, this request is to approve a resolution authorizing the use of enhanced penalties for nuisance parties beginning at 5 p.m. on Friday, August 18th and ending at 4 a.m. on Sunday, August 20th. And these dates correspond with cycle and welcome weekend. In the past several years, uh, we've had a very unofficial um, event occurring uh, where uh, many of our students have started drinking at eight o'clock in the morning, and that's resulted in large parties, a lot of parking issues, a lot of other problems during that time. Uh, last year, we had met uh, extensively with Iowa State University and the city to try and come up with some strategies to try and uh, quell these parties and, and get back control of this event um, so it didn't get any worse. One of the things that came out of that was uh, possibly increasing the penalties for the nuisance party that already was a, in existence. Currently, a first violation of the ordinance is a $100 fine, which is a municipal infraction. A second offense would be $200. Uh, this particular ordinance allows for a penalty of $650 for a first offense and $855 for a repeat offense uh, during the times that are approved by city council. And these correspond with what a simple misdemeanor fine would be if it was a simple misdemeanor. Uh, we use this tool very sparingly and uh, mostly for the most egregious violations that we see. So what I can tell you in using this tool last year, uh, we only issued three of these enhanced penalty nuisance parties uh, fines. Uh, I will also say that uh, Mother Nature helped us out a little bit last year because it rained about every 45 minutes or so. And I know that that did uh, lead to a little bit less activity, which is good, uh, but we can't count on that again this year. And uh, hopefully this will be another year to kind of get ahead of uh, the activities. And lastly, we want you to know that we don't issue these citations without first issuing a warning, which also includes going door to door in the weeks leading up to Cyclone Welcome Weekend where we do the Good Neighbor campaign in early August. So there's plenty of warning that we give out. We send out an email outlining the ordinance to property managers and owners in the, in the affected area. And both the city and the university will heavily publicize um, these changes or the enhanced penalty should you pass it. Uh, so we believe that um, we give uh, plenty of notice and warning through a number of different avenues to make sure people are aware of it should you approve it. That is 30A. Can you also, <clears throat> you mentioned this, I think, in meeting with Iowa State, you actually, people, uh, renters came up and asked for help. Is that right because of that? Can you yep. comment on that too? Uh, in previous years, and especially last year, we will occasionally get people that will call us and say, my party's gotten a little bit out of hand. Will you help me get control of it? We'll go out and try and help them out, cut down the numbers. We did that a number of times last year. Uh, again, only having three actual incidents that rose to the level of writing the enhanced penalty, I think is um, an improvement over what we've seen in previous years. Thank but again, you. if it's 85 degrees and sunny, all bets are off. Last year was not very nice. <laughs> Chief, were there any parties last year that got two citations because they didn't stop? No, we did not write a second offense to anybody. Yep. Uh, and, first offense was plenty. So let's say somebody's still around this year and they throw another party, but they got a citation last year. Does then 
this one count as a, a second citation if they get another one, or is it a, a clock starting over again? Uh, so it depends. <laughs> same resident, same location. It could be a second offense, but in most cases, it's probably going to be a first offense again if it's a different location because that's how we track them. And counsel, I was remiss in not introducing Emily. She's filling in for Tabitha Atten tonight. She's not been appointed officially yet. So Emily agreed. She's the vice president for student government. We welcome you. And so if you have any questions, you're welcome to do so too as a council member. It's ex officio. Um, did you begin the uh, period at 5 p.m. last year as well, or did it not begin until Saturday last year? Um, last year, this was the same hours that we utilized. So that Friday evening into very early Sunday morning, that pretty much encompasses the event for us at least. Any other questions? And Chief, the penalties are the same as last year? Yes. Those are in the ordinance that was passed last year, the enhanced penalties, the 650 and 855. All right, thanks. All right, Mayor, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, Jeff, I was just wondering if there's anything else that you might suggest council doing. Um, or if there's any, I guess, new challenges you might anticipate. And well, we've also going to talk about the towing of illegally parked vehicles, if that's what you're referring to, or are you talking about something else? No, I'm just asking in general. Obviously, since the weather was poor last year, I didn't know if there was um, maybe thing out, anything else that we should be anticipating. <laughs> Yeah, I think what we're anticipating, the university is going to continue most of the events that they did last year. They are going to cancel a few of the things that weren't well attended um, just due to cost. If people weren't showing up, they don't see the point in doing those again. I think this year, um, depending on the weather, will give us a better determination of how well these things are going to work. Because really, there was just as many people, I think, in town last year as the year before. But I think the weather cut down on some of the activity. So this is kind of like a second trial. Okay, thanks. I think last year too was a inaugural year and with events on campus, and I think that they're doing them, they're trying to be very progressive in terms of uh, reaching out and. Yeah, um, the university had a lot of very successful events that probably drew some people away from the unofficial and not well-planned events. Um, so that was a good thing. All right, we'll open up public comment. Comment. Does anyone want to address council on this topic? Seeing none, we'll close public input. Any closing questions? Otherwise, I entertain a motion on resolution. Move alternative one. Which is? Which is authorizing the enhanced penalties for nuisance party violations. Do I need more than that? No. Nope. Second. Move and seconded. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, 30B. So 30B is pretty much the same as what I just explained, but this ordinance approves for the immediate towing of illegally parked vehicles in a designated area during a designated time by council. So the request is to approve the resolution authorizing the use of immediate towing ordinance for certain areas on Saturday, August 19th, 2023, and that would be the calendar day. So starting at midnight and going until midnight. So again, this was another strategy uh, that we spoke with the university about. Illegally parked vehicles create a lot of problems in that area. Uh, at times it would have been difficult to get even a police vehicle down some of these streets where cars were parked on both sides. Uh, let alone an ambulance or a fire apparatus. Um, what we did see last year in using the ordinance, uh, we saw a huge reduction in illegal parking. Uh, we only towed, third, I think it was 32 vehicles last year. It looked a lot different in the campus town area. Uh, we provided plenty of notice in addition to the three things that we just talked about with the Good Neighbor program and the emails and the publicity. In addition for this, we posted, actually Public Works Street Department, posted uh, signs in the affected areas as a warning that uh, uh, vehicles that were parked illegally 
could be towed. And so that seemed to work. Again, we only towed 32 vehicles. We didn't have to write as many citations. We didn't see uh, really many problems with parking. But I know the word got out because if you went just to the line on the other side of where we designated it, there was a lot of cars parked there. <laughs> so we know that the word got out because people knew exactly where they could and could not park. And so we found this to be uh, very successful and did enhance, I think, the safety for everybody. So we're asking again to do the same thing as last year with designating that Saturday from midnight to midnight for the uh, illegal tow uh, towing of illegally parked vehicles. Question? Did, did the uh, the signs stay in place? I, I remember the um, the collection of signs by partiers over the years during football weekends. <laughs> We recovered uh, quite a bit of them, actually. I was also surprised. So we got a lot of them back. We've got plenty to put up again. They ordered extra last year, anticipating they might uh, disappear. But we got pretty lucky and got a lot of them back. Street Department and Public Works went out uh, the next day afterwards and tried to get as many as they could. And so we're sitting good. I don't think we have to buy any new ones this year. And they are a lovely trophy for a few people. <laughs> Chief, last year we, we went through this. I commended Rachel for raising some issues about um, are we in, inordinately penalizing those who have their car towed? And I, Rachel raised some good issues last year. Um, as we think about this this year, are we going to be doing anything different in terms of the location of where the cars are towed or the process? So the only location the vehicles will go will be to uh, our vendor for towing, which is CIT, uh, for them to take them anywhere else, they incur quite a bit of liability because once they hook that car up, they're responsible for it. So if they were to tow it somewhere else that didn't have the security that their lot does, then um, there would be a liability to them. Something was stolen, damaged, whatever. And so they're most comfortable with towing back to where they have a fenced in lot with security. And um, I would also say that because it's a city initiated tow, it's a lot less expensive than like a tow on private property. A tow on private property uh, might be 250 to $350. A tow when the city does it is about $50 in and out, um, plus the citation. So the, uh, the towing here is a lot less expensive than what it could be if it was on private property. And then is there an additional fee for the storage of the vehicle? Uh, only if it goes past a day. So there is a storage fee if you don't pick it up the day after. Um, but I think we have that capped on a city tow at $5 a day. So it's not a lot. Okay. But if it were left for a long period of time, you could incur more storage fees. Okay. Thanks. And Chief, how did the 32 compare with previous years in terms <laughs> of citations? Yeah. So honestly, um, in previous years, there were cars parked on both sides of most of the streets in that area, making it really difficult to get around. When I got out there at eight o'clock on that Saturday morning, I saw very few parked cars at all, or illegally parked cars at all. So they were all legal parked cars, which was fine. And again, 32 vehicles, that's on par with maybe a snow ordinance, maybe even a few less. All right, we'll open up public input. Anyone who wants to address council on this topic? Seeing none, we'll close public input. Any closing comments, questions? If not, entertain a motion on resolution authorizing the immediate towing of vehicles on Saturday, August 19th, 2023. So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item number 31, resolution approving request for city council to allocate 10, 000, up to, 000, to allocate $10,000 for ribbon cutting event at the James Herman Banning Ames Municipal Airport in conjunction with Juneteenth activities. I think the council, um, address Gregorio points this on the agenda for discussion. I think, um, well, if you move ahead with it, what you're actually doing is appropriating the funds today 
I think for us to move ahead, we have to make sure we know what group we're um, going to uh, give the funds to, and therefore we can enter into a contract like we do with everyone else, and we can come back with uh, defining um, the level of funding they want and for what particular projects or events they want us to help support. So you're not really approving it now. You're, if you want to proceed, you're authorizing me to move ahead and contact. I think it's going to be the NAACP, I believe, for uh, support of the Juneteenth events, including the ribbon cutting at the airport. So that would be the next step uh, if you want us to proceed. I think it's uh, the intent of Gloria's uh, motion was to um, appropriate up to $10,000. We're not sure if it's going to be five or two or, or five and under. We will report back to you after we find that out. And um, I think that's it, right? Yes, and I, I think that there is anticipation that there could be donor money that would mean the amount that actually is used is significantly less than the $10,000. Right. But because of the, the potential for the, um, the extra banning events, um, we wanted to try and be sure that, that there was an allocation available if needed. Some maximum amount. Yeah. And I would recommend it comes out when we come back, and you'll see it'll come out of the contingency fund. Probably is where we get the, the uh, funding for this. So it's really if you want us to move ahead, and we'll have to bring back a contract with you. Any other comments? So um, I'm going to be respectfully dissenting on this. Um, I think this was a very unfortunate decision that council made to rename the airport without a full consideration of other possible candidates. Hap Westbrook um, flew B-24s in World War II, spent two years in a POW camp, moved, uh, started Hap's Air Service here in Ames in 1947, spent decades of his life um, trying to enhance and develop this airport. And I've received a tremendous number of emails and feedback from the community that is just baffled by the decision to rename the airport after someone who, and there wasn't an, an adequate consideration of HAP. Um, I think this was an injustice and respectfully will be dissenting. Any other comments? All right, so this is going to um, – I'll open a public comment. Does anyone want to address council on this topic tonight? Seeing none, we'll close public input. Any closing comments? Otherwise, they entertain a motion on approving the request for city council to allocate, and it should be up to $10,000 per ribbon-cutting event at the James Herman Banning Ames Airport in conjunction with Juneteenth activities. I would move approval. Is there a second? Second. All right. Roll call. Aye. 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 All right. Any ideas, Steve, in terms of when the ribbon cutting? Um, might be would that be first part of june latter part of june or the, the juneteenth celebration is scheduled for the 16th and 17th and i don't know that there's been any decision about when the ribbon cutting would occur but i think they're thinking the 16th um okay Sorry, but it could, oh wait no i think they're thinking saturday morning Okay. More to come. The reason I ask is that you have a delegation going to a uh, celebrate a 30th anniversary of our uh, international partner city, and that's the week that we're going to be gone. So, anyway. All right. Very good. Move on to item number 32 staff update on the Stephen L. Shanker Plaza. Keith. Hey. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. I yeah, just want to give you an update on the, the aquatic features and a lot of this information was laid out in the, the staff report. But initially with the, the vision and design of the, the plaza, we were looking to have two water features. One, a water runnel, um, which is 
kind of the longer linear area Corey's pointing out and then ties into a, a spray pad at the at the bottom after months of talking with the Iowa Department of Health, IDPH, um, they determined that they really don't have a runnel designation. So what they look at is either a spray pad, which there's no standing water, or a wading pool, which has standing water in it. And, and uh, the runnel was designed to have maybe about three quarters of an inch of, of water moving through it. Um, we did have a, a curb on one side of the runnel. We had a, a seating bench on the other side of the of the runnel. Through discussions, it really came down to that it was to, to be able to make it happen, we would have to have a separate recirculation system for the wading pool. And it just really was uh, was cost prohibitive. So we looked at options and what you see um, in front of you is actually taking that runnel area, removing the curb, the bench, um, and having just a, a flat area and doing more of a linear spray pad that will tie into um, the, the original spray pad at the bottom of the, of the picture. Uh, it's hard to see, but uh, um, the, the red numbers were all part of the um, original design they were going to be part of the the runnel um, we have added you know some blue um, features to the top you know where Corey's pointing and then up and then we also are adding another activation bollard so if somebody's out there they would press one bollard to do all the features on the linear spray pad and then a separate bollard, which is down towards the bottom of the picture, to do the features of the, that bottom spray pad. So, so with this, um, it uh, reduces uh, and eliminates some safety issues that we had with the, with the curbs. Um, there's no um, depth of water with it. It's accessible um, for everybody. And, uh, and we really think this is a, a good alternative. Um, so we did work with... With Henkel Construction, well, Confluence, and then with Henkel Construction, and we got some uh, some preliminary cost estimates. So there will be some savings from the concrete changes, about twenty one thousand six hundred dollars. Um, the additional um, water features and the installation was uh, was closer to thirty nine thousand. So so the difference um, between the two is uh, is about eighteen thousand dollars. Uh, again, we feel that this is uh, um, a, a really good alternative. Um, it adds, uh, you know, some additional features, takes what uh, what we had and uh, expands on them. Um, rather than just having a small spray pad, it just extends it. So, so we feel that uh, this is a good alternative. Um, we do feel that uh, it's something that uh, that we should, uh, uh, the city, you know, should uh, pay for. You know, that additional eighteen thousand. We'll say with that 18,000, they did give us a range of costs for equipment and for the installation. And in that 18,000 incorporates the high end of the range. So, so there is a possibility that, you know, this does come in, you know, less than what we're, we're thinking. There's also the possibility that it does come in higher, but I think the, in conversations, the contractors have been cautious with their, their estimates um, so hopefully uh, it does come in a, a little bit less. The only alternative to this, what you see on the on the screen at this point, would be to to remove all of that concrete and and do nothing in the in that area. But but I think it really will detract from the overall fun factor of uh, of the the plaza. So uh, right now. You know, we're not looking for, for council to, to take any action. Um, you know, if we, uh, once we get the, um, if we move forward, we'll finalize the drawings. And then what we'll do is we'll submit the drawings to IDPH for approval. We'll send them to Henkel Construction to get a final um, change order with, uh, with final pricing. And um, due to, or according to our purchasing policies, um, this is less than 25000 so we would be able to approve this administratively. Um, we brought the last one to council because it was over twenty five, but it does reset, so so we can do that. So I guess at this point, we'd we'll look at if there's any questions or comments, you know, with this. Keith, I was under the impression that we thought maybe we'd come in a little bit lower than 
what we had originally budgeted. Uh, what's the the explanation for this added cost? Well, yeah, we were we were thinking that uh, um, we would would be a little bit uh, we'd get a little bit more money for the the concrete you know credit, and then the equipment would be a, a little bit less. So just one thing, the bollard, adding that bollard is about twelve thousand dollars. So so if we if we didn't add the the bollard, then we'd be at about you know five thousand, maybe six thousand you know dollars um, you know with it. Um, we did feel that installation was a little bit uh, wider um, of a range. You know, I think the between their low end and their high end was about four thousand dollars. So again, if things come in at the lower end, um, it could have been maybe a wash, but but in with the that extra bollard, we feel that it's a, a good thing because if there's only a couple people playing on that lower end and they hit that bollard and everything's on, um, you know, it may just not uh, you know look good with having everything running at one time. So, so so that's one of the biggest differences. Thanks, Keith. This isn't the first issue we've had with the Iowa Department of Public Health on this spray pad. Is this correct? Correct. In, yeah. I mean. It, it's, it's fascinating the level of interest that they have in our spray pad in Ames, Iowa. It's, it's as if we're building a nuclear plant here. I mean, it, for goodness sake, it's a, it's a spray pad. Well, they were interested in the runnel. Uh -huh. yeah. that, well, that was the so, issue. God help us if we built a runnel that didn't meet some kind of safety standards with the state. I mean, I not mean to be snarky, but um, do, does the state not have anything better to do? I mean, in some ways, this is sort of maybe sometimes the contractor's this is what they feel like we're, we're sort of micromanaging their pro project maybe, but I'm feeling this on this end. Um, this is an insane level of, of review for a spray pad. Yeah. So, so one of the things, you know, with it and council made this decision, you know, a while back about going with a recirculation system, you know, and, uh, and with this, because from a water conservation, climate action plan, a lot of sustainability, a lot of things that council is uh, discussing, so if, if with the, the and, and that's with a, a recirculation system, then they do this level of, of uh, detail. If we would just do a flow through where potable water goes out to features, it goes to the drain and goes to the sewer, um, they wouldn't do anything. You know, there's no regulation on it at all. But the, the downside of that is just with the runnel, um, if we had that running for 100 days from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., um, we'd, uh, we'd send 14, about 14 million uh, gallons of water down the drain. And um, so that's why, again, with the recirculation, and that's, the, that's why they get in, involved with it. And, and it's not unique to, to, to Ames. There, anybody else that's doing the, the same thing across the state has the, the same issues. Well, I think we should all feel we should all sleep safer tonight, knowing that this this <laughs> process is well protected. Thank you, thank you for your work on this. Any questions? All right, is there a motion on the direction to staff? So your desire to go ahead and proceed as proposed. If so, I would move that we proceed as proposed. Second. Okay, moving second. Any closing conversation? Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. All right, thank you. Have a good night. That right. didn't need to be a, a resolution, did it? Because it involved money. No. No, because okay. you're just we're just authorizing and proceed to negotiate a final price, and then it goes. Then it come, actually, then you'll just do a change order. So under twenty five thousand, we can do administratively a change order. Thank you. Great. All right, moving on to item 33, staff report on infill discussion and follow-up.
All right. Good evening, City Council. We had a workshop back in March to introduce uh, our first step towards implementing Plan 2040 in regards to infill. We had a very broad topic of discussion in March, uh, focusing first on, on design attributes and then kind of layering in what type of building types and, and what type of features are we thinking about in terms of being able to augment housing supply across the city. Uh, you gave us some direction that night. We are focusing specifically on one part of this where you had asked for more information really focused on how duplexes or accessory dwelling units uh, may or may not work within the city. Uh, is it a citywide issue? Is it a, is it a neighborhood issue? And then some other elements that go into that. The other tasks that you gave us direction on, we'll be bringing those back um, as we can. We want to bring this information to you as quick as we could from that March meeting so it stay fresh. The other items you asked for were just kind of um, more like prototypes, code language that could be adopted for townhomes, for pocket neighborhoods. And then a, a real significant one was which areas of the city would staff believe uh, were the were the kind of the highest priorities or maybe the best areas to have a significant impact on housing infill options in the city. So we'll bring those back here, uh, maybe in pieces in May and June, try and get all of that back to you here in the next two months. So we have kind of a, a full picture of all of the infill tasks and where we're going to go for the rest of the year. Um, so for tonight, we're like we said, we're going to focus on the requested information. There was three three topics uh, that we thought we could map for you to help give you some direction, or not some direction, give you some more background information about duplexes and ADUs. As we discussed in the workshop, the city used to allow for, for duplexes or second units in different ways across the city. In the 80s, that started to change. And then by the 90s, we had changed um, zoning district and subdivision regulations to, to again, kind of to stop that from occurring unless it was pre-planned to occur. And then by 2000, all of that was removed from our zoning ordinance. Uh, so for the past 20 years, the idea of building a duplex, uh, which is really two units on one lot has not been possible. We do allow for single family attached in new areas. So FSRL, you could effectively build a duplex, but it would be on two narrow lots rather than on one lot with two units. But we really don't see that in the FSRL areas. They're more designed to be an ownership product than usually two, three or four in a row um, rather than two units kind of situated together. Um, so for tonight, uh, we are going to focus uh, on this information. And then we tried to walk through a number of steps that I think from trying to keep it as high level as we can, if we can get direction on these higher level issues, I think staff can then come back with a, a more tidy package of what really those things translate into. And then we can work on how you want to go out to the community and what type of efforts are going to go into public outreach about this. So with that, I'm just going to go um, to the maps. I think the biggest one that, that we talked about was the covenants. And if you remember, we noted that if we change zoning, that does not overrule private covenants that exist in the community. Uh, let's see if this loads. And, and we had a concern that at least since 1990, there was a good chance the subdivisions had prohibited all versions of second units being allowed to be created within the subdivisions. So Eloise uh, was able to gather more information than I thought we'd actually be able to get. Uh, so we did get a pretty good sampling of existing covenants, and then we went to the effort to try to decide if they had been renewed also. So subdivisions may have been approved with covenants that expired, but after 21 years, which happens after 21 years if they're not renewed, um, so we think we've done a pretty good job of identifying which subdivisions in pink have covenants that no matter what we do as the city, as long as those stay in place, they prohibit either the construction of a second unit on the lot, creating a unit in your basement, or dividing the lot for a second unit. So there's a couple of different terms that got used repeatedly throughout the covenants, and they're basically the same everywhere. It's kind of the same covenant language, regardless of whether it was 1991 or 2018 when these things were written. So what you see here, uh, you know, pretty good match to exactly what you would think the growth of the city since 1990. That's the pink area effectively for the most part. Those are areas where covenants are and then all the green or yellow, whatever color green is what it is. Um, you can start to see where those are areas that don't have covenants. So um, uh, so with that, we also calculated in our in our table what that um, I'm sorry, we didn't calculate that in the table. We quoted that that's about 23% of single family properties that have some type of private restriction on them. Um, the next thing that we, 
we tried to uh, to map for you was impervious coverage. And this this came from our conversation in March where Eloise had kind of made a, a, a diagram trying to show what was maybe usable area on lots. And we talked a lot about when you when cities have gone towards these ADU ordinances, you might permit them, but if you didn't, if you weren't intentional about what the rest of your zoning regulations are, they may not be possible anyway. So we landed on a proxy for that question of what's really viable would be impervious coverage. So in most parts of the city, a 60% coverage of impervious area, which would mean buildings and paving is your cap. Uh, so that's the effort that we tried to go through on this next map was try to use our, our geographic information systems and we send out a, a um, stormwater bill based on your impervious area. So we had a GIS layer that had an estimate of impervious area on lot. So we're able to kind of match that up to lot area. And what we ended up picking out here was essentially 60%. Clearly nothing could be added. There wasn't very many lots that are at that number. That 40 to 60 range, uh, the, way, the way I thought of that was if we were thinking about something between 700 to 1,000 feet of impervious area, which might be the structure, it might be additional paving for parking or a driveway, that's kind of that number that you probably have to be able to accommodate. And obviously, as you get closer to 60, highly unlikely to, to accommodate that number, but really 50, 40, 55 percent, those would probably be able to work. So we're giving you that orange number as a, as a, as a maybe, a strong maybe that it would work. But everything below 40, we were very comfortable, you know, depending on your lot configuration. But otherwise, impervious area is not going to be a, a, an obstacle to doing this. So the bulk of the city is the impervious area would not be an impediment to doing this. So in the staff report, I think we end up with just about 90 percent of single family lots are well under 40 or under 40 percent coverage. So really, that doesn't look like that would be an obstacle to implementing something like this. Um, uh, the way it, the way it appears from this this exercise, and then our third third request for information comes back to the the question of rental concentration. We have quite a long history of trying to address this issue in certain parts of the city. So this map, the red uh, parcels are all registered units for the rentals. It's not just single family, so it does include the larger apartment complexes too, but. The only zoning we're showing you are areas that effectively have single family homes as part of those zones. So if you have an area we wanna zoom in, you, you can see that, but you can kind of, again, see the concentration, which back from three years ago is still the same. You have your core areas south of campus, the areas to the east of Iowa Creek with Oak Riverside neighborhood and downtown. And then you start to see a scattering of, of the rental properties as you go north of 13th Street. And then again to the west uh, along um, Highland, West Street, Campus Avenue, those areas is again where you see a strong concentration of rentals. Now, we did note that in the report that, that if you do go forward with ADUs and duplexes, we're going to have to decide how the rental code will work for these as well. Uh, and that's specifically because we have the near campus neighborhoods, which are, um, uh, we should have had that up here. I guess we don't have that on the map. Uh, which is really, I think, five or six neighborhoods that are those those highly concentrated rental areas where in the rental code, for occupancy purposes only, it doesn't restrict you from having a rental. It just controls your maximum occupancy. And the way that's written is you can't essentially add bedrooms to an existing structure to bump up the occupancy level. So if you have a three bedroom house and you add two bedrooms, you do not get to go from three to five adults in that structure. You're still with three. Now, if you had a five bedroom house at the beginning, you're allowed to have five. So if, if we do go forward to this, we're going to have to understand how you want us to address accessory dwelling units and or additional duplex units in regards to some of these areas and how the rental code is going to work with them. So with that, we made a composite map um, trying to, to filter out then removing the places where covenants are going to restrict it and then also uh, put into play how the impervious area would have restricted it. So you start to see now these yellow areas are the more likely areas where you can have these. And then you have the registered rentals layered on top of that for these, these single family properties. So this is probably the cleanest picture we can give you of how this all kind of plays out into where if you were to adopt this on a citywide basis, how this would potentially play out across the city over over at least in the near term. Again, those newer subdivisions, they may or may not renew covenants. We don't know how that would work, uh, but uh, for now we'd have to say they're not available. 
So with that, um, questions about the maps, any of the data that we were able to provide for background. So from there, I think um, we outlined essentially seven questions that we were hoping were high level questions that were gonna help kind of guide us towards whether we're gonna pursue this issue and to what degree we wanted to look into this. So I think the, we can walk through these. Uh, I'm just gonna outline them um, quickly, all seven, then I think, I guess, council discussion from there um, and we can go to the issues as as council sees fit. So the first question really is, do we want to allow for accessory dwelling units or duplexes? Once you answer that, is it a citywide allowance or is it a designated part of the city that we want to see those happen? Or you could flip that and say, are there areas we don't want to see that happen? Uh, one of the bigger issues is going to be if you're if we do allow for these, is it new construction only or conversions? Uh, the, the conversions has some has some issues in regards to uh, what does that mean for, for changing the format of an existing structure? You're going to have building code and rental code compliance requirements. That, so it's it still will be considered a, a unit that makes sense from the building code and from the rental code, but it might alter the way that structure really looks and, 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 and maybe even how it's really, well, it definitely would be changed how it really works because you do have to divide the units completely to meet rental and building code as two separate units. And then one of the questions that we're, that with the ADUs that is commonly comes up is, is, is there going to be an expectation of there being any owner occupied component to it? So does that mean that one of the two units has to be owner occupied to have that living unit, um, a duplex, we, we would not be able to control that in any way whatsoever. Rental state law doesn't allow us to control kind of capping how many rentals there are for single or two family homes, accessory living dwelling units aren't in that code. So how exactly that works might is still a little unclear to us. Um, but we need to understand how we're going to look at that. And I think the big trade-off there is the owner-occupied version, which is which is commonly adopted by cities, probably leads to less production just because it's expected that it's an owner-occupied property. If I'm going to live there, I'm going to want to invest in it. I'm making it into some kind of investment property with that, that piece there versus rental properties are already investment properties and someone might be willing to make that additional expenditure to increase the return on that existing rental property. So that'll be a question for council to answer as well. Uh, once we get into this, again, the size of the units, we, we currently allow for up to 900 square feet for an accessory building. Uh, that's 30 by 30. It's a pretty large structure that we allow for accessory buildings. Uh, so we have two questions there. Is it about the square footage of a unit? Is it about the number of bedrooms in a unit? Um, those two things can be separate or, or one or the other to manage how, how large these structures are. And then that would lead you to the parking question. Uh, I think um, if you allow many, many bedrooms, it's probably less likely you're willing to consider very little parking just because of the ratio of occupants to, to space to park vehicles. Uh, our comments are on parking that the more parking you require, the much less likely you are to see any of these be built. So I think in our opinion, anything more than one is going to be a real challenge for many properties to accommodate. And that's thinking that we are not being flexible on how that parking works in the sense that a single family home has to have two spaces. A duplex has to have two per unit. Those two types of uses can stack those. So it can be either side by side in the garage or it could be a one car garage with it with a space in the driveway. But then how do you put an ADU into that environment? Usually would not let you block the two garage spaces with a third party's car that's in a separate unit. Like those are the kinds of questions where if that extra space has to be independently accessible, that's where it gets really hard to put it on property. Now, you did just amend our driveway parking requirements for single family homes. So you now are allowed to build that flared parking to the side. So that might be an option for someone to be able to build that manageably off to the side of a driveway. Don't know that for sure, but, but possibly that would work for this kind of situation. And then the final question is a little bit more philosophical than it is standards. And that's the a topic of design and flexibility. Uh, we have, um, you know, as we said, we, we, can, we can apply the standards and what you get is what you get. But if our fundamental goal is to, to have as many accessory dwelling units constructed or have as many duplexes be feasibly <coughs> implemented into the fabric of our neighborhoods, then that would probably lead you to a different philosophy about how flexible there are. Are there any exceptions to help promote these things to happen? So that was kind of why we use that impervious coverage 
proxy in the first place was to say, are we going to be, is that going to be a hurdle? Would we want to adjust that? We, that particular issue wouldn't be an issue. But there are other codes out there in terms of setbacks, rear lock coverage, some other factors that go into that. And we'll just need to have a general sense of whether you want to be flexible in the middle or really just kind of standards are for everybody the same or we're just going to be equal treatment for all types of things. Um, so with that, we, we made a, a proposal in terms of of maybe kind of a compilation of these issues. It would be a starting point for a conversation. We suggested that new construction is the way to go. Um, I'm a little concerned about how conversions work over time. The city had some bad history with that in the past, so <clears throat> maybe we can learn lessons from that and not repeat that. Uh, I think the, the owner-occupied ADU, um, that's something we still have to look at. That's that number, that second bullet on our list, that we don't know that we can or can't control that, um, but we need to know if that's a priority to the council. Um, and if that's not possible to manage as an owner occupied unit one or the other, then would you still proceed with this? Um, near campus, as I mentioned in the rental code, we'll need to understand how to deal within the near campus neighborhoods, what it means from a rental code perspective. That, that really gets kind of interesting because um, it wouldn't stop us from issuing the building permit. You could build that second unit if it's allowed. You just won't be able to get a letter of compliance for more people on that property. So how does that work? Um, had a little bit of a conversation with inspections about how all these things would play together. We definitely would have to have a cohesive package in the code about how these things are going to work. What does that mean um, for rental inspections and everything that goes with that? But if we did say that we would only allow one letter of compliance, that kind of takes that problem away. That's how I have it written. I don't know that we can legally do that. We have to work that through with the city attorney about how that rental cap language in state code applies or doesn't apply to the situation. Okay. Um, so there's, depending on how that ends up, um, I, I believe, I think Des Moines has that standard. Now they had this before I think the state law was written, um, but they also have not produced very many ADUs. So I'm not sure that it's really a hot button issue for them either. So that's something we would have to look at. And then I think the parking, I said, we said one space max. Um, again, I think that's highly dependent on what you think of the size of the units and how many bedrooms should be in the units. Our recommendation is to stay at a one bedroom unit uh, that would allow you to have um, up to three adults under the rental code. If that's what, if it was the license as the rental all well, we're probably gonna have to write our own section about what ADUs mean in the rental code, but if you treated it like a house, you'd have three adults in a one bedroom unit. Um, but that's that's what we're looking at. Um, and, and to be clear, and this comes up in the zoning ordinance frequently, when we, when we measure bedrooms, and this came up with, with the rental code conversations too, how does a den count? How does an office count? You can't just label your way out of the standards. Um, it would be pretty objective about if it has, you know, if it meets 70 square feet, if it has a door, if it meets these other definitions within the building code, it's counting as a bedroom. So you just can't compartmentalize up an accessory structure and say it's a one bedroom, but it really has the ability to be a five bedroom unit. We would not allow for that to happen. Um, I think the other one that we can't really get into yet, which was a main thrust of our workshop discussion was the design compatibility. We think if we're gonna allow duplexes, I think we have to have design standards that go with that. Um, we have plenty of bad examples of, of, of duplexes that are illegally allowed on those lots, but they don't necessarily look anything like or, or operate in any manner consistent with single family homes around them. And the main uh, part of plan 2040 for infill was we support infill that's contextual, that it makes sense in terms of the fabric of a neighborhood. It has elements of single family if it's in a single family neighborhood. So we think if we're gonna go this route and add these, these duplexes in, I think we have to have duplex based design requirements, which means um, managing how garage orientation works, managing how front doors and relationships to the street work, um, rather than right now in our single family code. For the most part, there's no, other than we limit the total size of garage door, there's really nothing about a single family home that we directly manage from a design perspective. It's really whatever the builder wants to do, how do they want to situate it on a property? And that's totally fine in a new neighborhood. You have no neighbors. Everybody knows that they're moving into a new subdivision. You know what you're moving into. I think it's different when you have an established neighborhood and you have some expectation of what your streetscape is like, uh, what homes are like in terms of proportions and, and space around them. So I think it's a little bit different for infill than it is for new construction on the outside of the city. 
And then the final issue was, I think uh, for us, we said to start with the idea that ADUs are uniform, meaning if we have a lock coverage standard or we have a setback standard, the ADU is going to meet it just like a garage has to meet it or just like a single family home has to meet it. So um, that was our final suggestion in terms of let's approach it all uniformly as one set of rules. We can pull back from that. What, I mean, we can pull back or go forward however you want to look at that and evolve the standards over time. But this is really how do we want to start? So with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd I, um, like to take comments from council on where to go next. Thank you. Questions, comments from Kelly? I have a couple of, of clarification comments or questions on the the first three bullets. Um, Under staff comments. Staff comments, yeah. Okay. So the first bullet is, I think you said, intended to um, stop those conversions of single family homes that we saw proliferating before the 90s cracked down in our code. Um, when we say we're allowing ADUs as new construction only, does that also include garages that are already built? I mean, if you're, can you convert a garage under that first bullet to be your ADU? Cause it's clearly not a new building or a new structure. It's there already. Are but you, are you talking a detached garage or an attached garage? Uh, I was thinking detached. So I would think of them differently. It, my my first thought, and this is where you guys have to explore this. My first thought is an attached garage. You always have to replace the parking if you take it away. So a lot of homes aren't going to mm -hmm. be able to replace the the parking if they convert their garage to living area. So that's probably not the likely one. I think a detached structure that you convert. I don't think that's as significant as, as, again, carving up an existing home. So I think an accessory structure that you make into an ADU does not have to be restricted by that new construction standard. I think a detached could, ha could have its own expectations. Okay, then um, the second bullet with regard to the one letter of compliance, I understand we don't really know whether we can do that or not, but from a a logistics perspective, if someone builds an ADU for their own use, it's not a rental, and, you know, grandma comes to live in the ADU, and then they sell the property, then we have to be sure that there's an owner-occupier, and if they want to rent the ADU, there's only the one rental possibility on that property. I, the, I think the transfer of property is the thing that, that I find difficult to get my mind around because I think a lot of people might be attracted to building an ADU for their own use for family reasons. But once they sell that property, the use could change. And especially in Ames where a lot of affordable properties seem to get gobbled up for for rentals. So I, I don't know how to express my concern about that or to work that into the discussion of the single letter of compliance for an owner occupied property. So my first thought is, is two things. One, uh, the and I don't know if this is the term that we would use in Iowa, but, but I think we would, if we build a, a second unit on a property and we have that expectation that one is rented or or one can't be rented however you want to look at that i would want to have something recorded on the property that i would that i consider a notice of limitations is the phrase i use so it's it's with the property record that the owner has agreed that this is restricted uh, at, just to put somebody on notice um, I think you as a as a buyer of property you're always having to look into that and if you're someone that's looking to make it an investment property with two rentals on it, um, I would hope they would take advantage of the pre-inspection process from our inspections division. A lot of people do, and that would be, again, a chance for the city to say, oh yeah, we're happy to look at that. You can only have one of these two, which one are you asking us to do the pre-inspection on? Um, those would be my two first um, lines of defense in terms of someone thinking they're buying something, but they can't do what they, they wanted with it. Um, those, that's probably the best two options I have for that. And then the, the third bullet 
I just wanted to be sure I'm interpreting that statement of treat ADUs as accessory only. I'm taking that to mean, again, this is connected to the idea of the owner occupancy and the, the building of the ADU is not building a new rental unit. It specifically is related to that near campus neighborhood. So in the way, I, when I talk to the building official about this, if you are legally, if you build a new, a wholly new unit, you get the credit for all of the bedrooms in the wholly new unit. It's only if you have an existing structure and you do an addition to that or modify that to create bedrooms that you don't get to count those. So that's that conversation I had about if we allow duplexes, uh, a duplex would be a second full unit. And in the near campus area, you would be able to rent all of those bedrooms consistent with the adult occupancy limit we have. The ADU, I think, should be clear that it is not a fully independent unit. It is accessory to the primary unit. And, and we have to we need to tie that together in the rental code. But my intent was that that doesn't count towards more bedrooms. Thank you. And if council wanted that to be the way, then we would clarify it the other way. I appreciate the clarification. Other questions? Kelly, remind us. Um, Cedar Rapids, Des Moines, you looked at the number of accessory dwelling units they had. Um, could you remind us the, the, the scope of how they've used these? It's pretty small. It, it, it is, yeah. We're trying to look at the chart from March. Can you? Seven ADUs for Cedar Rapids and six for Des Moines. So, our, so the chart that Eloise had in four Moines. years, seven in Cedar Rapids and six in Des Moines. So you're talking about cities that are much larger than ours. Yeah. Um, so I just, I don't see this as being a huge part of our portfolio of infill. Um, I'm very supportive of doing infill projects, but I'm, um, and I still, I don't know how many we're actually going to see with, with these. Um, I think it'd be very unlikely if we constrain these to new construction only, given the fact that almost all new construction is being done in subdivisions that have restrictive covenants. Um, I mean, there are some some occasional lots, but there just aren't a lot of bare lots in Ames. And so, if, you know, if there's a fire or there's a, a tear down, it's possible in so, a situation like that. So maybe I wasn't clear. When I say new construction, it means it, it doesn't mean that new the house it means it has to be wholly built independent of the existing house. So you could keep your existing house and build a new structure in the rear yard. Oh, I apologize. That would be a new construction. Yep, so it's not tear down and rebuilds. It just means you're not carving up your existing home. Okay, Sorry thank you. Sorry if that wasn't clear. No, thanks for clarifying that for me. But still, even with that, um, I, I just have trouble believing this is, this is going to make a major change in our city. <laughs> I, I would agree. I don't think we're seeing this as it is going to create dozens of affordable housing units per year. I, I don't see that happening. I think it's going to be a slow takeoff if we do this. Um, it's not going to be cheap to do it unless you find ways to make it cheap to do it, which right. I don't think is our interest. Uh, it does give some flexibility to homeowners. Uh, one thing that we have seen is right now we don't allow you to create accessory buildings with habitable space because we're trying to prevent this from being a second unit and becoming a rental or some kind of thing that isn't expected. We don't allow this in the city. We have it a lot of people, not a lot, a handful of people each year that, that really just want to make more living space for their own family in a detached structure in their rear yard. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And we have to say no to that. Um, so this might be an add on for some owner occupied properties, just like, like Gloria said, they just want extended space for their family. It might just be living area that they want outside of their home. Um, it doesn't necessarily even have to become a rental unit. Some people would want to generate income and make it an accessory dwelling unit. It is hard to imagine that we're going to see, you know, dozens of these start to pop up every year. That's that doesn't seem realistic for the the trends that we've seen in the Midwest. Other questions? I would say I like I kind of like the package proposal here from staff. Because um, I mean I I, I do. A, Agree, you know, that we're not going to see a whole lot of these all of a sudden. I think this is a nice gradual start. Um, I don't see any harm in doing it, uh, you know, just that maybe we won't 
you know, like Kelly said, we won't see dozens every year or anything like that. But um, like if we were interested in just moving that staff mm -hmm. package. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so you're, you're talking about the, the seven bullets that are underneath, underneath staff, staff comments. comments. Yeah. Please. So, yeah, I would move that we proceed um, following the staff recommendations, the seven bullets under staff comments in the staff report. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any closing um, comments or discussion? Yeah, Kelly, just a little more. Can you, can you play out sort of an example of this in an existing neighborhood? Pick a neighborhood in the community. It doesn't really matter. And if someone wanted to do this, the process, and I'm particularly interested to, would the neighbor, would the neighborhood have any say? Would, is there a public notice that would go to the neighbors? Or could someone do this irrespective of neighborhood concern? I think we would anticipate that you would meet all the basic zoning standards and there would be no notice to a property owner. You would follow established standards. There would be no exception process. There'd be no variances to do this. If you needed an exception or a variance, then you go to the board of adjustment. Um, but that's not likely. If, if that's the method we create, then obviously be fewer and fewer of these even get built. So we're trying to make a uniform expectation everyone can do it and there wouldn't be notice because it wouldn't be discretionary there was sh it, this is always a tricky thing with notice people want to know what's happening but once you tell them it's happening and then you say you can't input you can't affect the outcome then that's also a frustrating thing so i we could definitely require notice of people so they're aware that that's what's being built but you can't come in and tell staff i really wish it was on the other side of the lot I don't have any standards to say it needs to go on the left side of the lot versus the right side of a lot. So that notice to a neighbor is kind of a hard thing to know what I would do with that. If we can do it just for awareness, but I don't think it in changes the process a whole lot. Do, do any of the city ordinances that you studied have a process for uh, neighbors within a given vicinity to be able to give input? Um, maybe they don't like this. Is there anything that, it, I mean, have you seen anything in any of the other cities you've studied? Well, when I was investigating Bloomington, they started slow and started with a special use permit or conditional use permit requirement. So that meant everybody that wanted an ADU had to go through that process. So it was noticed, it was discretional, discretionary, and they decided, you know, after three or four years only having three or something like that permits, not very many resulting from their from their process to eliminate that entirely because they just weren't getting enough response of ADUs being built. And um, so, so some have started with those kind of um, noticing requirements and more in, uh, tighter requirements, but now as time moves on, they've kind of lifted them because they're not seeing um, people build and they wanted to encourage the build. And so I, we try to anticipate the law of unintended consequences where we can. And so what if we had a situation where uh, uh, people who owned a property in Ames, they wanted to create an ADU and a quiet neighborhood and the neighborhoods all like, are you kidding me? It's going to change the character of this street, of this neighborhood. And are, are we designing this with any possibility for the affected neighbors to have input? Is that something that's a priority for us? Or well, I think, I think what we're, we, we definitely are gonna have an outreach process designed around if we adopt these rules, this is how this works so that the, the community is aware that it's happening. But I don't, I was not anticipating that if, if they are allowed that each permit was subject to some kind of notice or review process by an abutting neighbor. If that's going to be required, that's what Eloise was speaking of. Um, if that's an exception, like you basically, if you would have to make it an, an exception to have a second unit and that had to go to the ZBA, then you would have a 200 foot notice around the property and the, um, we'd have to develop criteria about why or why why you would or wouldn't approve one of these. And you can't have basic premise of zoning is you can't put it to a vote. 
Like you, you can't make zoning decisions by a vote of the public, like the opinion of the public coming to a, a meeting to say, I agree or disagree with it. It has to be objective criteria. Um, it, it, ZBA can interpret those, that's fine. We would have to establish some kind of criteria to say it's okay as an exception or not if we were gonna create some kind of public review process. And it definitely would not be a council type of permit. It would have to be a ZBA type of permit. I, I would feel like having the ZBA um, involved would create a safeguard so that if there are legitimate concerns that the neighborhood would have, it would be a forum for hearing those. And then let the ZBA sort of work through those and balance those. Um, it seems like we're we're giving opportunities for people to significantly change the intensity of their um, of the use of their property without any kind of input from the neighbors who would be directly impacted. And if that's something we're wanting we're going to do, I think we should be upfront about that. But I I do think that's what we're doing. Well, let's go ahead and motions are made and seconded on the <clears throat> on the bullets. If you feel strongly about that, you'd make a motion that would follow up. To see if you want to add that to be you know, part and parcel of you know the criteria that's that Kelly be working on essentially. Right well, now we're just giving some direction, general direction mm -hmm. where where to head essentially. Well, oh, would it be appropriate, Mayor, if I'm going to support this? I guess I sort of would like to see if the council has an interest in adding this kind of safeguard. I'm not even sure how to make this as a motion, but I. Um, I'll just try this, and Kelly, if you can help me. To well, there's a motion this. on the floor in a second already, so. Can I can I make a motion for an amendment to the motion? You can, the you can make them if you want to amend them. Maybe it won't go anywhere. Okay, go ahead. Um, Kelly, help me on this, but I, I would move that we amend the current motion on the floor to ask staff to direct to create a process of approval involving the ZBA that would give uh, neighbors in the affected area an opportunity to raise concerns and then the ZBA uh, would give approval of uh, the ADU. Is there anything you would tweak to that? I mean, that okay? That's fine. I mean, I know, I know where you're going with it, yep. so we'd have to figure out what that means, but yeah. Okay. Is there a second? Motion died for a second. So then this is really interesting because this becomes sort of the, the bus in the neighborhood 2.0. Guess who's coming to dinner? And they're not leaving. And so once again, we're, we're gonna ask neighbors to uh, have their neighborhood impacted without any input. And council, this is on your watch. Tim, um, we haven't had the public input part of this yet. So I don't know how you can say we're asking them to do it without any public input. We're just giving staff instructions to come back with something so that we can actually have public input. No, no, you misunderstand my point. We're, I, I offered a motion that would give affected neighbors the opportunity to have input. I didn't get a second on this. Well, I, I would say that I, I don't think it's a big concern because there are many things a person can do to their property without getting the permission or approval of their neighbors. I could build an accessory structure right now, as long as I don't make it habitable, um, that could be as big or as garish, you know, and, and we will have design signers too, so I don't necessarily mean that, but um, my greenhouse slash chicken coop that I put in my backyard, right? I met my setback requirements and luckily my neighbors love it and adore the chickens, but had they not, there wasn't anything they could have done about my building that accessory structure. But in um, fairness, this is a major difference between chickens and people. Yeah, well. Well, and I also yeah, think that we don't say how many people can live in a particular house. If I purchased my home, then my family members can come and stay with me. And whether my neighbors, um, my neighbors can't give any input to that. And I see this as very similar. And what we know about ADUs and where they're popular, it's actually usually a family member that's living in that structure. It, it's more an opportunity for families to be able to support other family members who are maybe seniors or young adults that are still in college. And so I, I think we might be creating a problem that 
that doesn't exist, but I'm certainly open to hearing back from staff as they continue to explore this, but I don't think we're there yet in terms of knowing all, all of the potential issues until we give staff more direction. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna this Mayor, we, can, can I just ask for clarification on something before I vote? Yes. So Kelly, um, the bullet points have the first one as new construction only citywide. So where does the the Jewel Drive property that was an example come in with that bullet? So we're, we're talking about in the staff comments, uh, Mr. Friedrich had asked the council to consider allowing for duplexes and in this, um, in this conversation and the referral to staff, you had said, let's let's address whether we're going to deal with it a citywide issue or not. So I would say with this motion, it would mean that property gets thrown into the mix of potentially being allowed to have a duplex um, because okay. it's zoned RL right now and it's a vacant lot. OK, that's that's helpful for me, understanding the how the example plays out. Amber, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, no, I mean, I think that everyone's made some really good points. I, I agree with much of what Bill and Gloria have said regarding, you know, getting public feedback um, as we move forward in the process. Thank you. Just right. in, Go ahead. In, just in closing, um, I respectfully, I don't think the public is going to give us any input on this. Um, where I think you need to design a space for public input is it is it the time when someone wants to build this that's when you need to get uh, an opportunity for neighbors to say yay or nay what concerns they have so once again council we talk a good game about public input and uh, respecting neighborhoods and and then when we actually have a vote to create a mechanism for affected property owners to have a voice we're, we're denying them the opportunity to, to raise an issue in a ZBA setting. And it's not that ZBA would necessarily deny the request, but we're not giving people an opportunity even to have a voice. And so this is the second one of these within a, within a month. Um, I, it's, it's, it's a disturbing trend. Those the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? Nay. Motion carried. So just to be clear, so what we will do is we'll effectively come back with a kind of a, a outline of what a code section would look like, and we'll bring in a little bit more detail from inspections and public works about utility information and everything else that kind of comes in as a whole package. And if that works for council, then you will tell us how you how and to what degree you want to go out for public outreach with that. That's so that would be something that we should be able to do this summer. So we'll be back to you with that and be able to have some some outreach this summer or whatever schedule you guys want us to be on for that outreach. As a point of clarification, you're not bringing back an ordinance for council to have a first reading on. You're basically bringing on structure on that, and there's going to be allowance for lots of public input. Correct. It will not be noticed as a, as a first reading of anything. Okay. It will be. It, it's going to be comprehensive, as if it is an ordinance, so everybody knows exactly what is allowed or not allowed. That's the only way to have really good input on this is to be very clear about what you can and can't do. So that's that's how we'll come back with it. But it will not be a first reading. Okay. Thank you. Eloise, I just want to compliment you on these maps. Yeah. That that map on the restrictive covenants <laughs> took a lot of work. I'm not even sure how you did that. And so kudos to you. That was very helpful for council to have those maps. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate yes. it. She spent a lot of time coloring on, on <laughs> evenings and weekends. So. Yeah. Dominic in the GIS division from Public Works was a big help. In all yeah, super also. helpful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right, moving on. Item 34, a plat of survey for 220 and 420 South Teller Avenue and 5810, 5898 East Lincoln Way with those hybrids. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have a plat of survey 
uh, application for uh, the uh, the addresses there, uh, 220, 420 South Teller and 5810 and 5890 <coughs> East Lincoln Way. And this is uh, submitted <clears throat> by uh, Wiffles Hybrids. Uh, they do plan to construct a um, uh, industrial facility, seed distribution facility here. And the proposal is to take the four quarter quarter sections there uh, that you see on the map and uh, combine them into two parcels. And so uh, the proposal is to create uh, a uh, larger um, 117 acre parcel and then a somewhat smaller uh, 32 acre parcel where they're uh, going to begin construction and development of the site. There are a couple of reasons that the plan of surveys come before you tonight. Uh, it does require a public right of way dedication, which they have uh, prepared, and as well as they have submitted a uh, waiver request. Uh, the applicant has submitted a request by letter asking to have a uh, permanent waiver of the sidewalk installation requirements here, which we discuss in the report. Uh, the um, applicant's request is for the permanent waiver. We've laid that out uh, as well as staff's um, preference, uh, staff's support, which would be for a more of a deferral option. And there's a few of those options there under, under the alternative too. So um, I think that summarizes it. Uh, and um, so I can answer any questions at this time. Let's... Um Let's take up item 34A and B first. Welcome up public comment. I anticipate 34C may take some discussion. So is there any questions on item 34A or B relative to the PLATA survey or dedication of right of way? All right, open up public comment. Does anyone want to address council on Items 34A or B, we're going to, we'll take separate public comment on 34C, which is the waiver or deferral of sidewalks. All right, we'll close public input. Is there any questions? If not, I'll entertain a motion on resolution approving PLATA survey for 2020 and 420 South Teller Avenue and 5810 and 5898 East Lincoln Way. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 And I entertain a motion on resolution approving dedication of right of way. Move approval. Second. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. All right, 34C, the uh, topic of discussion of uh, sidewalks. So yeah. maybe you could help us out um, and cards on the table. I'm always, uh, I wanna advocate hard for sidewalks where they make sense. Um, I've been a proponent of uh, requiring landowners to go forward with putting in sidewalks. Um, and I've been discouraged with property developers who have used the deferral process to delay putting in sidewalks for sort of an indefinite period at the hindrance of pedestrians and cyclists. So that's sort of my starting point, but I wanna do this in a way that actually makes sense. So could you clarify how this sidewalk, this path, um, where would it go? So in terms of the <clears throat> specific placement right now, um, it would actually be a, a, a five foot wide sidewalk that would be on a, uh, an easement uh, along the, the front of the property along Teller. Um, at this point, what you see there interpreted on the screen, the, the uh, black solid line, that would be the extent of the sidewalk installation requirement. So right now, uh, there's not a lot in this area of the community that's developed, obviously. So uh, it would terminate at the north end of the property there uh, and also at the, the far south end. And, and so we have to think long term about a particular property and imagine um, if development would continue 
<clears throat> but um, help us understand sort of the south end of this. What what could be developed? Um, I, I worry about having re requiring a property owner to develop a sidewalk to nowhere. So that's that's not good governance. So, so is is that what this is, or is there a possibility of further development to the south where this would make sense? Yeah. So, so what I just put up is the is a drawing from the DOT about these interchange improvements that are going to be under construction starting this year. So Wiffles is outlined in red. Um, what what you see is that the the land just to the south of Wiffles. If I can get my pointer here to come on. Here we go. This land in this area, it eventually could be annexed and developed. There's a frontage road that's being built uh, by DOT that's going to run parallel to Highway 30. So whatever sidewalk that is ever constructed will ultimately intersect with this um, frontage road intersection before you get to the interchange. So in that sense, this frontage road is going to lead to access to multiple properties that theoretically should be developed over time within the city. So to me, if it extends south, someday it would connect into this frontage road and you would have a place to go east west along the frontage road now crossing the interchange that's a different story i don't believe dot has accommodated uh, a pedestrian crossing in this design so south of the frontage road i'm not sure exactly how that would work um, but to the frontage road it could be done and then to the north the lincoln way here are these sidewalks until you subdivide or develop on a property well the two the two properties immediately to the north there's no obvious reason that they redevelop anytime soon. They both have residential structures that are are, are um, usable by the owners. Uh, they're not really large sites that would be probably turned into industrial anytime soon. So in their minds, there's no connection that would occur to the north for a long time. But when it does go north, it would connect to Lincoln Way and the city does have, uh, we do have a bike facility as a shoulder <coughs> kind of facility on Lincoln Way. And there's no sidewalks on Lincoln Way, but eventually that needs to also exist with development that occurs along Lincoln Way. So ultimately, there's some version of a network here, uh, east or west side of, of Teller, not defined by the city. That's why it defaults to the Wiffle side of the road. Uh, that's just the way we've written our ordinance with, with industrial areas. It's either the north or the east if there's no other defined path by the city council. Could you go back to the south again? I apologize. Yep. I'm still struggling with this. Can you use your pointer to help help us to see what benefit there would be of the sidewalk on the south side? So the sidewalk, if it would, would get to the Wiffle south boundary, right? And then when there's development in this area right here, they would also need to build a sidewalk to connect to Wiffles and come down to this intersection. And what I was saying is that that intersection, then you would have... Uh, a long-term extension, either east or west. Also, it was further south of here that I I would have. I do not know how a sidewalk would continue south of that intersection. Yeah, so that I think that's a pretty safe bet. But it could go to the east. Yeah, east or west. It's a frontage road. Um, there should be options to to take a sidewalk east or west uh, along that frontage road. Okay. Thank you. Other questions. Kelly, obviously, I don't have a vote on this, but I'm just a little, I understand the ordinance, but it just seems that something's going to be put in because it's in the ordinance, and it may be really a sidewalk to nowhere, maybe for a decade or two. And the ordinance also talks about, you know, for a city interconnected you know, I was just uh, looking at the attachment that is in the uh, in the packet. Let me get it up and just read it. The, the quote. Uh, 23-403-14, sidewalks and walkways. Sidewalks and walkways shall be designed to provide convenient access to all properties and shall connect to the citywide sidewalk system. I get it when we're in you know, town and in a lot of commercial areas, but this one, there really isn't a citywide sidewalk system. And it just seems like it's gonna be really a long, long time, you know, coming. So is there an option to have it graded, prepared for a sidewalk within the future? And there's some kind of agreement that that could put in 
when other properties are being developed and you got a network that kind of is compliant with what our ordinance or our, uh, yeah, our code section, uh, 2310. So normally if that's done, you do, you do an agreement, you take financial security to ensure it being done. Mm -hmm. Uh, the way we wrote alternative B was to try to sidestep that financial security. Mm -hmm and attach it to future development instead, instead of having to carry a $100,000 letter of credit or something with us, like you said, that could be for a long time. So we tried to write B to be one, <clears throat> no letter of credit was necessary. Um, and upon notice by the city, you had to do what you just, just said. Uh, but we also, in, in part two, we, we weren't waiting forever. So we said at time of the third building, you had to build it regardless. So for Wiffles, maybe that's three years from now, maybe that's eight years from now. I don't know, but it mm -hmm. was it was more of an expectation that they would build out their master plan and trigger it. So if you if you didn't want it to be triggered by a building, uh, we we probably would want a more formal agreement if you were to <laughs> defer it. Because um, essentially what you're saying is it's a temporary deferral. We just don't know till when. Right. And I think you would want an agreement if that's what you were going to agree to and not trigger it by a site plan in the future. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, is this, I know that this is disconnected from Wiffles, but just in general, it seems a little disproportionate to have one property owner have to put in an expensive sidewalk and the other person across the street gets by without having to do it. Right. Um, and so consequently, and the worst case scenario would be someone who's across the street and would have potentially both the south and the east side of the street doing the sidewalk. Yes. And so... Was there was thought, and this probably predates, may, may predate, you know, even you. you know, it Unfortunately, it doesn't. Oh, it doesn't. Okay. Well, okay. So we can blame you. I was no. here. No, no just all about it. No, just thinking about the fact that as you had this big, and obviously it's the first really big industrial development we've had too, yeah. um, is just some kind of a cost sharing of all property owners. Because to me, heck, I'd buy the property across the street. That's not an offer, by the way, but uh, just uh, because I would, I'd save seventy five, a hundred thousand dollars not putting in a sidewalk for sake of discussion. I'm just trying to think of ways to, uh, again, this is this transcends Wiffles. This is kind of like you know, right, development wide. But anyway, be, I mean, this really the standards coming out of the subdivision code. The the ordinance that we're applying to them in site plan was not written for a thousand acres of greenfield to be developed. It was meant to fill in gaps right. in existing areas. Yeah. Uh, so it's the subdivision code, just like you would with the new residential subdivision, you would expect them to build out and connect to the system. But here you just see such large chunks of land. It, it just feels different than, mm -hmm. than the residential areas. Um, the way, the reason it says one side of the street in that missing infrastructure ordinance was the, the conversation we adopted was that there wasn't a high enough volume of traffic to necessarily require that on both sides of the street. Now our that was prior complete streets policy, complete, complete streets policy. And the likely outcome of your pet and bicycle master plan would be both sides of a street should always have a sidewalk, not just one side. So it, it, the city council did choose to just do the one side. There's absolutely a, a cost difference on which side of the road you're on. Um, but that's, that's how we chose to mm -hmm. do it at that time. If, if we had a city plan of where a shared use path or a sidewalk was going to go, you could take a financial contribution from someone for the city to implement it or see a project implemented in the future. Public Works right now doesn't have a defined plan. They say we 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 need to have a pedestrian facility on Teller at some point. It's just whether it's east or west is not not defined by them. So it's really hard for me to have a financial me mechanism to try to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, you could if we don't have this program, but we just don't have like a citywide in lieu fee option for people. Um, that was also intentional because we didn't want it to be on the city to fix the gaps. I understand this is not a gap. This is new development. It's mm -hmm. a lot different. Yeah. We just don't have that in fee, in lieu fee option. We should maybe be able to make it a little more equitable that you can build it if you want or contribute to that. And then it's used in the future, some across the street or something. I just don't have that right now. So if there's an agreement that can do that, um, maybe we could do that. But I don't have an ordinance that allows for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it just seems that given the size of the land and what people are investing, it's just, yeah. it's, it would just be to have some kind of cost sharing in terms of all property. Owners. But I know, I know it's not in the ordinance, but anyway, and that's wax, waxing philosophical, but I just, I just struggle with, 
sidewalk that goes to nowhere for a long period of time. But anyway, it's just, uh, I, I get it. And your, your staff is basically bringing to council's attention what the ordinance says and what's been set up. And so now you got to wrestle with, you know, how do you, how you deal with it? So, right. So that's, that's why they're here. They're requesting the waiver. Um, mm -hmm. the first choice is the waiver yeah. or the deferrals is an option to, to try to address that timing question to some degree. I will say this too, is that based on my conversations with, um, Wiffles, and I've had the, the pleasure of meeting them twice is that their approach to what they're doing and developing, you know, is, I think it's a tremendous fit for the city of Ames. And I know that they're going to, they want to be a great corporate, you know, neighbor and, uh, and, and a part of our community. And so, um, uh, I know they want to do its best, you know, for their employees as well, too. <coughs> so I do so, want to point out if you were to grant the waiver, we didn't make that conditional that it at least still had the sidewalk easement along the frontage because they, they themselves, if they built it, weren't going to build it in the right of way. So we wanted to make sure that at least that option was preserved if there ever was to be a, a path here in the future. So if you did waive it, we still wanted an easement. If you do with the deferral, we'll we'll deal with that through that process. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Otherwise, Kelly, could you just speak a little more? Um, you were helpful in the north. Could you talk a little more about what could happen um, around the interchange? This is all sort of new for council. What are your thoughts on on how that could be developed? So right now in Plan Twenty Forty, we just have it striped all purple as employment. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's how it's decided on the north side of Highway 30. We just have it all striped as employment. And our 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 conversation about this side of town is it needs to start industrial. But over time, there's probably a need to add some kind of commercial component. So whether that's on the west side of Teller at the intersection of Lincoln Way and Teller, or is it something more to the south? Um, I don't know, but that's we do understand that someday there's going to be some commercial out here because it's just so much industrial land and theoretically a lot of employment. It's just not going to be the first thing out of the gate. And it's more service commercial for the needs of the people. We're not talking big box or anything like that. Okay. Is the cyan, cyan color on there? Is that, is that a DOT on right. property? Yeah, it's the, essentially the footprint of the right of way that they acquired. <clears throat> this is a little bit older drawing, uh, but but this is the, this, the schematic layout of the of the project. Thank you. Kelly, can you say something more about option B2, the this approval of the third site development plan? What is the plan for for building out this site? Um, I, it, it's a <laughs> it's it's Justin, can you even recount it all? There's a lot the, of buildings. <clears throat> so um, the the general master plan, uh, so to speak, is uh, there'll be the initial uh, distribution facility with some small office space. There then, I think, is a uh, expansion to the south in the future. And then finally, um, later on after that, there is an expansion to the east northeast. So that item two makes the development of the sidewalk hinge on internal development or internal to the site as opposed to external taking into consideration the two parcels to the south right and, and to be clear also we're, we're not talking about the whole uh really phase one doesn't trigger the full half a mile of sidewalk it, it triggers the um the length of the parcel on teller so i can bring that back up so that black line that justin put there that's not actually what's required with phase one that would be the full build out of of the whole sites because because really phase one is only about half of that frontage so then yeah so it's on that new parcel that's being built or not built created so that parcel d is what we're talking about so the way condition two is written is three buildings on parcel D. Alternatively, parcel E is buildable. So if you were to build on it or if they were to modify that boundary in the future, that might also trigger the remaining sidewalk component. So I guess it's more like about two thirds of it would be built now and one third is deferred with parcel E. So the request for a waiver from Wiffles 
states a half mile long. So they're asking long. for the full teller, the full half a mile of their frontage. Got it. <clears throat> what we so if we weren't here tonight, the part that the city staff says the ordinance required is just the frontage of parcel D. But because we're here, they're saying, can we can we address the full frontage? Got it. All right, I'll open up public input. Is there anyone who wants to address council on this topic? If so, would you please introduce yourself and you may begin. Good evening, Chuck Winkle, Black Hunziker Companies, 105 South 16th Street. You know, we've been working on this project for a long time uh, with the Wiffles organization. And again, I, I think they want to do uh, what's right here. And <coughs> to me, what would make sense, some of the ideas that have been kicked around is the easement makes total sense and wonder if there is a way that we can structure it so that it, if it ever connects to anything else, then they have to put it in or they have to agree to the assessment. But to run a half mile of sidewalk, the city has so far no plans to go below the southern boundary now. I'm hopeful that we'll talk about that soon because to think that we're going to build an interchange out there and that there isn't going to be asks for development, I think is probably not realistic, but I think that they would, um, the deferral by when we build second or third building still isn't going to go anywhere. I mean, Kelly even said on the north, it's not going to go through that property. So starting to get to it, I don't even know how you would get to start without walking through, which is basically along the highway uh, there to get to the start of the sidewalk. If you if you walk on the, the shoulder and walk down through the ditch and up on the grass to get to the sidewalk that then goes to nowhere, that that's the part. And it's a half mile. It's not, it's not a couple hundred feet. And until there's something down there for it to connect to, it could be worn out and need to be replaced again before, I mean, concrete over time, we have a city crew that goes out and marks sidewalks that get broken up. And, and this is an industrial area. There are not people gonna be walking out here to get to retail stores. I mean, there, there just isn't. It's not like you're gonna, the Wiffles employees are gonna walk a mile to get to someplace else to buy something to walk back. So, Again, if it connected to something else anywhere, I don't think there would be an objection to it. And is there a way or a mechanism that, again, over time, this will be a $100 million facility. So it's not that it's the last, you know, eighty dollars or $100,000 we're talking about here. It's like it's just one more thing as a company is starting to go and starting to grow here. Do we need to put in something that has no practical use to anybody? But... Can we put the easement in and can we say they can't protest the cost or it gets a, I don't know how that uh, could functionally work. They're not opposed to that. It's just the fact that it doesn't serve any purpose and there won't be anybody on it for what could be a decade or more. And if we annex that, if we look forward and we annex the ground to the south, and if that other stuff gets developed and there's something else to connect to, I think uh, I talked to Jacob Whipples, the, one of the uh, company owners, and said, by all rights or by all means, they would want to uh, participate and be a good citizen. But to put it in now, a half mile, you know, that's 20, 2,600 feet, five feet wide, um, that is connected to nothing on either <laughs> end. And if you're, I know it's they're in early stages of that, but what also gets lost is, as they're building this road, this road will be built up. So the road's going to be up and then the sidewalk's going to be down. That a lot of that is low out there. So there's a lot of grade that has to be brought up to build the road. So where does the sidewalk go then if the road's up here and the sidewalk's at, at a different level and all the traffic that's going to be coming off to go to Verbio and all the other stuff there, I, I just don't see where that's going to be, where people are going to be walking towards the interchange and, and actually having a, a good outcome. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Anybody else? All right. We'll close public comment. 
All right, Council. I'm not very happy with the idea of, of requiring the sidewalk when it doesn't connect to anything. So on the other hand, um, I'm not really in favor of completely waiving it because there is the potential for the development. And what I would really like is some way to say we're deferring this without the, the letter of credit until there's a trigger that's actually connecting this property to something else, mm -hmm. probably to the south. But I'm not sure how that would work. I mean, I think we can do that. I think one thing that's really key for Wiffles is they need the plat of survey approved tonight so they can get get moving on their site plan. They can start some grading, but they, they really are need to get their site plan approved. So uh, if we need to um, approve the plat of survey, um, grant a conditional waiver with, with Wiffles having some kind of agreement in place for the deferral that staff needs to work on, and say that's attached to the to the site plan um, prior to occupancy. That could give that that could give us time to figure out what that means and bring that back to you. And then they can still go forward with their project uh, and get their site plan going and get everything done. And that buys us many months to get to an agreement that makes sense. Um, so what what if that's what we were doing? Basically, you're saying don't tie it to building construction. Tie it more mm -hmm. to the city adopting a plan or there's a, a something that really makes sense in terms of that connection. Uh, happening and they're filling in their segment based on that. Yeah, I think that's, to me, that's what makes sense logically in an area like this. So yeah. Is so there a legal mechanism for how we would do that? A deferral without um, one of the outlined options? So it, so option two is cra staff crafted that within the subdivision waiver option. So within the subdivision code, you can waive whatever and you can also condition it um, to be on however you want to do that. So I, I think you can technically grant a waiver uh, without the financial security and use the agreement as the substitute for that. Uh, and and there can be some triggers and we can have that assessment language. There's some other things that can be put into that uh, without having to carry the letter of credit. I just, it's, I can't tell you exactly how we would do that tonight because it's not written. You say the agreement, agreement has to be drawn up. I think we need an agreement. I don't think you can just put a condition on a resolution. This was written to be as streamlined as possible where the resolution was the decision. But I think we're talking about more contingencies here <coughs> than just a simple resolution would, would outline. So we would have an agreement of some type with Wiffles about the triggers. Um, so to, to, so, so Kelly, done. council approved um, 34A and B. Is the sidewalk issue also part of the plat of survey, or is it something that council can give direction to staff? You can work through an agreement, basically give them a, the, the flavor of what they're trying to accomplish, so and I they can would, move forward or not. Yeah, I, I think it needs to be tied because it's a subdivision code request. There needs to be a subdivision. So I think that the third motion would be to to approve a waiver conditioned on receipt of an agreement that has these these triggers in it and that receipt of that agreement needs to be prior to to occupancy of a of a building on the site so you're you're approving the subdivision you're waiving the sidewalk conditioned upon receiving an agreement and and our hook here isn't the financial security the hook is they can't use their building and that gives us a lot of time the building's not going to be ready until harvest season so we have a few months to do that and if the also if there's a indication that's really until it's part of the condition be as a connection to something south that is being developed that would give you some direction too or you yeah i i think b1 is the start of what we would work on um in that case it was upon notice by the city that a sidewalk or shared use path had to be built across parcel d well we'll make it about parcel d and e in this case we'll give them a 12 month period of time to go do that we can add on some other stuff in there um, so it would be the, the easement, it would be enter into the agreement, and we'll we'll figure out those triggers to make sense about when something's planned or constructed okay. in this area. All right. A motion, I'm open to council. I'm proposing a motion to that effect. So I, I was trying to take notes uh -huh. on this, and I'm not sure whether I have the starting point for the motion. Um, I would move that we approve a waiver conditioned on receiving an agreement that is drawn up to designate triggers 
for the sidewalk construction. For the construction across the teller frontage of parcel D and E. Across the teller frontage of parcels D and E. And you need also approval of sub, the subdivision also, is that you said or something like that? I think you already did that with A and B. Okay, very good. So Thank you. your first two motions, I think already approved that. I didn't want to hold up anything else. Is there anything else that you need in the motion to um, complete this task tonight? You've tied back to occupancy. Did you do that yet? Yeah, and, and have their agreement returned prior to occupancy of a structure on parcel D. And would this include the easement? Um, you need to do that separately. Yeah, that. The, the easement was include that too. Yes, that and the and for the the easement needs to be a part of that motion also. Right. Yes. What about the financial security? So, no. Absent the requirement of that, we're saying we're not going to require that. That's what that's that's what's being waived. Essentially, the financial security is being waived to allow for a deferral. Okay. With a sidewalk agreement. So right. I I think I may have lost the thread here again. So yeah. we and. So I, it's I, a, it's a win. Yeah. So, I so think we it's need a, the agreement before. There's two conditions. One, they grant us a, a sidewalk easement across the frontage of Teller, and two, that they um, enter into a an, into an agreement for the future construction of a sidewalk along the Teller frontage of Parcel D and E, uh, based upon triggers of of connections or or plans of the city. And that agreement has to be returned prior to occupancy of a building on parcel D. Did you get Turn that, Carly? Because that's my motion. Before it's authorized, right? Do you want to? Are you? I want to make sure that you're clear on this and that there's no. Since we're basically getting this thing going, you want to read it back? That you have. I think we know what we want. I mean, those are the those are the elements that we need. What what you read back? You're really good at this, by the way. <laughs> that was very impressive. So I, I'm pretty comfortable that we know what we need to put into a document. It's teller frontage. It's an easement. It needs to be returned before there's occupancy of a building. No financial security. Okay. Is there a second of the motion? I'll second. Mark, you've heard the conversation. Do you have anything that you want to add? Do you think you're you're, you're comfortable with that? And, All right. And the, the city will draft that agreement so it's right understand i just make sure that the motion is complete and accurate to the point so they can go ahead and get going on it all right uh roll call well, one other comment on oh. this mayor i uh i love the fact that council unanimously supported the complete streets um, ordinance uh, it was a long process it's, it's an aggressive um plan uh, i fully support it um i think this is the first time we've had a chance to really look at a project like this and so as we look at these, this becomes a precedent and we're gonna look at them on a case by case basis. Um, but I think that this um, glorious motion makes uh, a lot of common sense. And I think it communicates to the community that, that uh, we're gonna still be committed to complete streets, but we'll do it in a way uh, that makes sense. So I fully supported this. Roll call. Aye. 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 Anything else on this one, Kelly? I do not. All right. Thank you. Let's uh, take a, a short break before we move into item number 35. We'll uh, get back together in about five, six minutes. Thank you. 
All right. We are going to move on to item 35, hearing on City of Ames budget and property tax levy. Corey and Nancy. Well, good evening. We are here for hopefully the final step of approving the uh, FY24 uh, budget. Um, at the last uh, Max Hurry hearing, excuse me, uh, public hearing, we had some questions uh, related to um, uh, some of the financial information we passed out. So we have that to present today uh, prior to the public hearing. And we'll just run through that quickly. I think we have three slides total that were included in the council packet. Um, on the screen here, we have uh, four columns. The column on the uh, far left, as you can see, is uh, the previous year's budget. Um, the tax levy rate was $9.83. Uh, that generated uh, $33,600,000 approximately dollars uh, in total property taxes. Uh, if you recall, back in February, uh, the council held uh, budget meetings. Um, the manager's original recommendation for that meeting uh, was $9.96. That was included in our in our budget presentation and discussion. Uh, that generated um, about $34.8 million. As you can see, that's a 13 cent increase we thought at the time, and that generated about $1.2 million uh, in increased property taxes uh, for the upcoming fiscal year. And we've talked about it a number of times, but uh, there was some modifications in the residential rollback, as you might recall. Uh, and so we, uh, after that was adjusted at the, at the Department of Management, Department of Revenue, we took those into consideration. And that was what we presented last week, or excuse me, to council meeting, or the council meeting before this one uh, to the city council. Uh, that valuation change, as you can see up on the top of our chart, was about $82 million. When taking that into account, uh, maintaining all our expenses and not reducing uh, any programming costs or, or capital project costs, uh, the uh, projected increase uh, in the tax levy rate was 37 cents, uh, up to $10.20. Again, that generated uh, just over uh, $1.2 million. Um, we utilized a number, uh, historically have used a, a number of levies in generating the city's total property tax rate. Um, there's been a lot going on at the state house related to property taxes. Uh, we took that into account, um, made some adjustments in um, the manager's final recommendation uh, on the column on the far right in the yellow, we tried to make that as clear as possible. Um, ultimately, uh, we felt the flexibility of including all of the levy rates for the employee benefits and the general levy rate uh, was the appropriate thing to do given um, the conditions uh, of property taxes under discussion at the state house. I think the, the most important point is that the property tax rate remains the same at $10.20. Total collections and property taxes remains the same, uh, just, just different utilization of property tax levies. And again, uh, we're, the proposed uh, tax rate for the upcoming fiscal year is $10.20. A couple more slides. There was a question uh, regarding uh, sample property tax calculations. We have provided those in the past. Uh, there's really three different classifications that the city has focused on, uh, primarily a residential. This, so this is a, all three, I guess, classes of property, residential, commercial, industrial. Uh, this was what was uh, distributed uh, during the February council uh, budget sessions, as you can see, there was a $31.50 increase uh, in total dollar change per 100% um, valuation or $100,000 in valuation, uh, which was a, just under a 6% increase. Um, the commercial valuation of about $100,000 was a decrease of roughly $40 or 4.5%. And then industrial had a slight increase of $3.84 or just a, a percentage change of uh, just under a half percent. Uh, the next slide uh, here represents the uh, valuation change as a result of the change of the residential rollback. So residential rollback went from about 56.5% to 54.5%. As you would expect, there was a decrease in the residential uh, increase in total taxable valuation and therefore a decrease in the total tax payments amount. So uh, the total anticipated uh, average uh, tax payment increase for $100,000 in residential property is $26.22, or just under 5%. Uh, commercial has, still has a decrease of $23.33, uh, just a little bit under 2.5%. Uh, and then industrial did have a slight increase of $24.63, uh, or just a slight increase of $2 or 2.78%. So that's um, those are the material changes that uh, from our, our discussion back in February. Um, otherwise, the budgets remain consistent throughout uh, our discussions. So this reflects the final budget we've reported that has a 37 cent increase. That's the 
on average, what people can expect uh, in relationship to their prior year's property tax increases. Every hundred thousand dollars in tax of assessed value. Any questions on that? It's confusing again, because the new assessments do not affect next year this budget. Like you, correct. That's will affect the the budget we'll prepare next year at this time, and bring to you for fiscal year 24-25. Steve, could you remind us the the amount of the budget from last fiscal year to this fiscal year went up? What percentage? The budget action in the general uh, the um, Overall tax asking, right? Is yes. what you're asking? Yep, that was about 3.6%. 3.6% was all we were asking. That's including all of our insurance increases, all of our salary increases. Uh, we were hit with, you know, a 25% increase in all of our property insurance. So I think our departments did a very good job in the general fund. We're doing the general fund now, yep. not the um, not road use tax fund and not the utilities. Uh, they did a very good job in the general fund of holding the line as much as possible. Yeah, I just want to point out what I think I hope is obvious is that to only have a 3.6% increase in the inflationary environment we're under we're experiencing. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is a miracle. I mean, what where else are you going to see that level? So I just um I just wanted to pause. I know people are are thinking about their assessments, but when you look at the the fiscal restraint that we somehow exercised i don't know how the department chairs did this given the inflationary pressures it's really remarkable yeah, i can assure you we didn't we don't need any action from the state legislature to make sure we're going to be very prudent with our budget i, I guarantee you we've well done said. it years in the past and we'll continue to do it regardless of any state uh, legislative action so since the door is open regarding big increases in assessments mm -hmm. And people are very concerned about their property taxes going way up. Absolutely. Since you have this chart, why don't you just explain, I think the rollback, people don't understand how that affects it. And also, maybe Steve can comment and you can comment, <laughs> that we don't all of a sudden, I think there's a perception by some that the cities are just basically waiting for all the money to come rolling in when assessments go up and nothing can be farther from the truth because if we wanted to do that we would have our levy rate up at eight dollars and ten cents right. versus being where it's at which is several dollars or what is it I'm, I'm, don't quote me exactly on what but the point is is we're significantly less than the eight ten right. just just walk through corey for a second and then steve just comment i think the point is is that people understand property values have gone way up, but there are mechanisms in place, one of which our fiscal conservatism and working very, very hard to manage the city well and deliver you know, value to our to our customers, essentially. Sure. I mean, you, you just touch on that, Corey, and maybe you want to comment on that too, Steve. Um, sure. I, I think the easiest thing to focus on is probably residential properties. So um, you'll see $100,145. Or $100, what that number represents is revaluation in a residential property that occurs from year to year. So what was valued at $100,000 last year uh, had a revaluation, and now it's equal to $100,145. What happens is that value is reduced by the- That's, that's, that's theoretical, the point yeah. that, that varies from, from year to year. Based yes, on, yeah. and that's a very good point. But I think that's the point that the you know, next year, that 100000 which has gone up $145, may be much higher because of reassessments. That's, I think that's what the, the fear lies in, is that there, that's going to be a significant number. I think what probably goes unsaid is that the residential rollback is, in all likelihood, going to be about 47%. Who sets the rollback? The Department of Revenue does the calculation. So we have no say in the matter. We have no say in the matter. So the point is, is that the state comes in and says, you're going to reduce it. So just using the math, if you took uh, 47% of 145 or whatever it's going to be, that means the taxable value will be significantly lower right. next year than what it was this year. Yeah, and, and I'll admit those aren't final numbers. Those right. are just uh, early Department of Revenue projections. We're looking at a 47% residential rollback. And that's a huge reduction compared to what's, what's a typical rollback been over the last 
four or five, six years. Uh, one to one to two percent. Maybe it would be a significant year in change in residential rollback. It's customarily in a non-assessment year, very low. Even in reassessment years, it's a they take the whole state classification of residential properties, and that's how they manage the limitations. And so, um, so a seven percent. Or eight percent rollback is almost unheard of. Is that right? Yeah, it's it's not anything. So that's part of the safeguard time. being built in. And and I agree with you, Mayor. The other component that people aren't tracking with, and I appreciate this, is they don't understand how we work backwards. So we set the price of government, and then we figure out what the millage rate needs to be to accomplish that. I so ask Steve to yeah. comment on that. Yeah. Point. So yeah. maybe Steve so wants to add sure. to that. What's the other? That's point? that's the rollback and the way we work backwards is setting right. the, the price, right. the millage rate. Yeah, it might be interesting to point out when I first started here many, many years ago, I understand it was hard some buggy times, <laughs> but can you guess what the rollback was back then? 1979 it was about 88%. So you can see it's dropped ever yeah. since significantly. So you would have been taxed on a $100,000 home, you've been taxed on $88,000. So it might seem strange to you, but when we begin the, we begin the budget process in about August. You don't see until February, but the finance department and the assistants start working with departments on this. We put together a capital improvements plan. A lot of that affects your debt service and some of the rates and their utilities. And when we sit down and we've got a team that's really dedicated here of all the department heads, I don't have to tell them, I want you to only increase it by 2% or 3%. They know that they're gonna to try to maintain the same level of service at the least possible cost. So the first thing they do, we ignore, we don't even know what the assessed values are going to go up yet. Right. And we certainly don't know what your rate's going to be. And we don't know what the rollback's going to be. We first determine what it takes in the coming year to maintain the same level of service. And they do it at the least possible cost. So they're always thinking of ways of cutting costs of their additional budgets. Now, sometimes we also add some new things on, which is hard to do. So if you want a new DEI coordinator, a new sustainability coordinator, that's not in the base. So first we say, what does it take to maintain the same level of service? And then we have segregated out some new levels of service we might have. We put those together and then we start, it gets later on in the year and we start getting some information, maybe what the rollback's gonna be, the assessed values are gonna be. We figure that out and we know, I the, let's do this coming year, I need $1.2 million more incremental amount to cover a new sustainability coordinator was a new one, plus all the same level of service. So what does it take after we find out what the rollback is, the assessed values, what does it take to generate that amount, okay? And if the, if the assessed value went up, if it goes up, I can lower my rate to generate that $1.2 million, right? If it's vice versa, then I might have to raise the rate to generate it. But that's how we do it. And we don't try to say, look, we're gonna find out, we're gonna keep the rate the same. If our assessed value goes up, we'll generate as much money as we can and then we'll develop a budget that spends that kind of money. We don't do that. We do not do that. We work first on what we need to maintain the same level of service. Any new additional ones, we wanna to try to quantify that. And then we figure out what it's gonna to take to do that. So we've been very consistent with that. I think Brian did a study for me the last 10 years. We lowered the tax rate, I think uh, six years, one year we kept it the same. So we don't try to, to fill the bucket up as much as we can, only the, as much as we need. That yeah, one other aspect of this, sort of the third uh, leg of the stool, is that we have an expanding tax base. And so we're spreading that cost over an uh, increasing number of commercial, industrial, and residential properties. So yep. that growing our tax base is really an important aspect of keeping our property taxes low for everyone. That's right. We hope to, we hope that because the more we grow, we spread it for more people, and it's not the uh, existing properties that have to be raised as much, right, uh, yep. to get the giant money. This, this is already probably repeating what people already remember, but we're just about a third or less of the total property tax yep. bill also. That's true. The school is the largest portion of the top property tax bill. We're the second, and then the county follows, and you have smaller levies as well, too. So we might be operating one way. Someone else might operate a different way. And I'm not saying that the county is... I think that they all also try and be very conservative in, in their budgeting and 
budget the same way. And in conversations with cities around the state, I think a lot of cities do exactly the same thing. They set their budget and then they back figure what the levy rate is going to be versus trying to take advantage of a situation. So, so what scares me, there's two different uh, property tax bills going from the House and the Senate. And one of them would, um, would uh, mandate that no one property can uh, have more than a 3% increase in their property taxes, okay? Well, look it up there. You just said we had a very tight budget. Well, that's an average now of four, almost 5% with a tight budget. To meet that, I'd have to cut out 2%, all right? I'd have to cut out 40% of the budget in the general fund. You can't do that without affecting existing service levels. Yeah. And that's a fact. And again, they're in the areas that are the quality of life to people. Now, I'm not downplaying all the utilities, but it's, you know, it's the police and the fire, but it's also our parks and recreation, all the, all the um, bike paths, things like that, plus our library, which everybody, I, I know we, we get, they do an excellent job, makes it for the quality of life in this community. It's just going to be very hard. If the legislation if goes. If the legislation proposed, which I believe are some arbitrary figures, some of these numbers are throwing out there going to hold us to, um, to show people we've cut property tax in the state of Iowa. So we're really fearful of that because I think the people of Ames um, have enjoyed an excellent quality of, of, of life and services we provide local government. I'm not sure we'll be able to promise that in the future. Well, thank you for allowing me to pontificate a little bit here and bring the attention. But I know it's a very hot topic. People are understandably you know, surprised. There's a good news situation, too, is that if you want to sell your house, the assessor, by code, by our legislators, has said you have to assess it at 100% of market rate, plus or minus 5%. If they don't do that, basically they are in dereliction of their duty <laughs> and violating what they are supposed to be doing by Iowa code. So the point is, is that they have to, and this is statewide, prices are going up all over. But the point is, look at inflation, look at what market rate is for houses so anyway all right thank you thank you any any other questions for kelly oh, sorry kelly <laughs> sure bring him back i was much shorter than kelly <laughs> kelly you're responsible now tonight for the budget so why don't you know as i say i was shorter than kelly tonight so all right Corey. sorry we'll cut all that right. out of the video yeah. i do the same thing all right I declare a public hearing on resolution authorizing and approving the adjusted fiscal year 2022-2023 to be open. Is there anyone who wants to address council on this topic tonight? Seeing none, declare the public hearing to be closed. I entertain a motion on resolution authorizing and approving the adjusted fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. And I'll declare a public hearing on the City of Ames budget and property tax levy for fiscal year 2023-2024 to be open. Is there anyone who wants to address council tonight? Seeing and hearing none, declare a public hearing to be closed. Entertain a motion on resolution authorizing and approving fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. Move approval. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. Corey, Nancy, Steve, I know you guys have put a lot of work into this and really appreciate it. And... Uh, it's uh, nice to bring it home, and now we just wait and see what happens under the Golden Dome in terms of how it might affect next year. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Moving on to item 36, hearing on zoning text amendment on electric vehicle charging station setbacks. Does council have any questions for staff on this particular item? Kelly's I coming up. I have one question. All right. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no apologies. Um, 
we've got language in here that says uh, on page two of the, the action form um, that under the proposed ordinance, it allows for an unlimited number of charger encroachments, but only allows for one cabinet per four chargers to encroach. So when I look at that in the proposed ordinance, it, it seems like it's implying that we're only going to have four chargers and one charger cabinet. But that action form seems to imply we could have eight chargers and two charger cabinets or 12 chargers and three charger cabinets. So one cabinet per four units. Is the intent to limit this to one cabinet and four chargers for all properties or to do it in that kind of incremental if you have eight chargers, you can have two cabinets sort of way. <laughs> it's, it's meant to be read as unlimited number of chargers. So if you had level two chargers, there won't necessarily even be any cabinets. So they're just going to be allowed to encroach. So it's supposed to be an unlimited number of charger pedestals. And then you get one extra cabinet for every four chargers or, or unit thereof. So if you have six chargers, you could have two cabinets, but you can't have three chargers until you get to... I'm sorry, three cabinets until you get to more than eight chargers. But it would conceivably be possible to have multiples Absolutely. of the, the yeah. cabinets. Yes. Uh, yep. Okay. Yep. So it's not meant to be one and four only. It's meant to be unlimited chargers <coughs> and then one cabinet per four chargers as you build out a total number on the site. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Kelly? Kelly, I apologize. I don't know what a cabinet is. Yeah, so the, the picture in the staff report, if you go to page five, so you'll see that that Tesla installation there. Oh. So that's one version. of So the bigger white box is what we're calling a cabinet. And then in the background, you see the green transformer. So there's a distinction between a transformer and then the cabinet is where the electricity comes in from the transformer and then it's split out to the charger. So it's a big piece of equipment. It's not small. Um, that's why we're saying you only get um, a certain ratio of those to be within that encroachment. If they're not in the encroachment, we don't care, right? If you if you can meet setbacks, have all the have the cabinets and the transformers that you want. And then there's that other picture um, at the beginning of the staff report, um, different profile. You can see this was an older installation. It's in Altoona where there was a higher ratio of cabinets per chargers. And this this is all from Tesla. Not every purveyor of electric charging systems is the same. Um, but they are down to a one cabinet per four ratio for Tesla. Others others might have a different ratio, meaning they might have fewer chargers or more cabinets, depending on how you look. Is there a way you can explain this in lay language, what a cabinet does? It's really just the, this is, and it's going to be lay for me too, because I'm not an electrical engineer. Uh, it's it's taking that, that high voltage power from the transformer and then it's splitting it out into the individual chargers. And it's for them, as they explained it to me, that's the most critical piece for their efficiency and cost to be close to the chargers. It's where the most wiring is in terms of coming out of that white cabinet and going into the individual chargers. That's why they were really advocating to be able to have at least that, that ratio of four to one. So pragmatically, you have to have a certain ratio in order for this even to work, you have to have these cabinets. The cabinets have to exist. The closer they are to the chargers, the more cost effective it is for the company. So if they were remotely installed, it will cost them way more to do the chargers. So it would discourage the, the implementation of the chargers. Okay, thanks. Picture on page five is a good example of one cabinet for each four, because there's two cabinets shown in the picture. Yeah. And in that one, they're oriented um, parallel to the street versus perpendicular. So that angle of how wide or how deep they are kind of varies a little bit. But I think the way Tesla described it, like a two by four footprint, two feet by four foot, it's kind of that working number in my head. Okay. And again, this is very much about the, the Tesla system because they were the ones that were advocating for this. Others would be different or have different ratios. I have one other question, and that's related to screening. Mm hmm in the ordinance, uh, section 29.408, 
four point A point I, <laughs> um, at the very bottom of the page, we have the note that electric vehicle chargers and their associated cabinets are not a mechanical unit and are not subject to screening. But then on the next page, we've got section four that seems to talk about them as screened. Section four. Uh, the very under top. Four. It's the, sorry. It's the it's the continuation of that mechanical units and transformers screening required thing. So the very top, the change that's written in there seems to imply that the units do require screening. So they would not because so f it, it seems a lot of context. You don't have the whole series of of language that that's in between here, but it is it's still directed at mechanical units. So by if by definition they're not mechanical units, that last section doesn't apply. It will apply to transformers. So a transformer is still a mechanical unit. Um, HVAC equipment, meters, all that kind of stuff still counts as a mechanical unit. Chargers and that one one cabinet will never be considered that by definition. Okay, but the transformer will. Yep. So the transformer right. and everything else that's normally subject to screening, that still is. This is an allowance to kind of, if you bring it into the site, it does start to get a little bit ridiculous to screen stuff mm -hmm. when it's 100 feet from the road and it's really not out in, a, in an obvious place. So that's trying to give a little discretion that if you bring that stuff in, into the site, we're not going to be as concerned about screening because it's very unlikely to be seen. It, it makes sense now that, that I understand the distinction between the cabinet, the transformer, and the chargers themselves. Yep. Okay. Yep. Is the uh, term electrical vehicle charger, associated cabinets, and trans uh, and mechanical unit defined someplace else in the uh, ordinance? And would we, that be a benefit or not really? We did not write any new definitions for this. Is there a need for one? Um, I thought it was a pretty narrow world that we're talking about. Okay. So I didn't think there was going to be a lot of interpretation where I needed definition. And is transformer included in the definition of mechanical unit in the definition? It is. So the, the, the change here was to put it in the heading so it was easier to find. If you read the definition, which is buried in a different part of the code, right. you would find it. But now by putting it in the title, it's easier just to communicate to everybody what it is. That's helpful because I was, I was curious why it was called out as and transformers, but then transformers aren't really referred to in the section. It's mechanically. So anyway, yeah, I, I just just living through all the development review, yep. it's, it's just easier. It's not great, but it's okay. easier to communicate. All right. All right, declare the public hearing on this zoning text amendment on electrical vehicle charging station setbacks to be open. Is there anyone that wants to address council on this topic? Seeing none, declare the public hearing on this item to be closed. Entertain a motion on first passage of ordinance. So moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Corey Aye. 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 Thank you. Move on to item 37, hearing on zoning tax amendment on affordable housing parking requirements. Any questions for staff on this item? This is really just for future use, right? Because the the one that had sort of spurred this, um, they decided they could fit the two, so we perhaps? They showed you a version that met the current code because that's what we need to do to submit it on time last week. Right. So ultimately, when you approve the project, you'll decide if you approve this, you'll decide if you want them to build that extra set of parking or not. Sure. Okay. It'll allow you to consider it again in the future. Okay. So none of this is by right. I think that was one question we had at, at one point. Is this an automatic that everybody gets to go down to 1.5? No, it's not. What it is is it sets the, the, the greatest amount of reduction that council can give somebody. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. All right. Declare public hearing on this item to be open. Is there anyone that wants to address council? <coughs> Seeing none. Declare public hearing to be closed. Entertain motion on first passage of ordinance. So moved. Second. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you. Any, uh, just related to the uh, 
initiative of this? Any uh, response yet from the uh, Iowa economic or the uh, team? So all they they released, I think, on Friday, all of the submitted applications and their self scoring. So I think we're in a group with around eleven applicants that are, have a, a score that's the same as, as self scored. So over the next few months, we'll get actual actual scores from IFA about ours. So it's oh, it's I very, was understanding. I thought I thought that they kind of gave an initial indication. Yeah, I think it. that's how it sounded. But all it was is they identified who all the applicants were and their self reported scores. I see. Okay. So you get a sense of what's involved here so it's going to be very competitive which we assumed it would be um so we'll have to hope that we make it through the process and and get our get our award very good thanks kelly yep all right move on to item number 38. any questions for staff on this item Hearing none, declare a public hearing on the 2022-2023 Airport Improvement Program South Apron Rehab to be open. Is there anyone that wants to address council on this topic? Hearing none, declare a public hearing to be closed. Entertain a motion accepting reported bids. So moved. Second. Thank you. Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed or abstaining? Motion carried. And entertain a motion on resolution approving final plan specifications and awarding division one as alternate a and division two and its alternate b of the 2022-2023 airport improvement program south apron rehab to construct of ames iowa in the amount of one million two hundred fifty one thousand seven hundred and five dollars contingent upon receipt and execution of agreements for federal bipartisan infrastructure law federal entitlement and state airport improvement program grants in amounts necessary to finance the project exp expenditures. So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 All right. We've got I number 39. Mr. Dunn, are you done? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, good evening. I gave you a lot of information in the council packet, so I'm going to just touch on just a handful of, of highlight slides for you. The first place I thought I'd start is just looking over the last five years at the history of water and sewer rate increases. So you can see over the, the past five fiscal years, water we've increased on average 3.7% per year and sewer 2.8% per year. And so if we compare those to what's happening around us, both nationally and in Iowa, trends over a five-year period for water nationally, we're at 3.7%. Sewer national average increases have been 4.5% per year. And as a, a point of reference, the CPI over the same interval was 3.9%. So in Iowa, drinking water rates were very close to the national trend at 3.6. Sewer rates, you can see, have been higher than the national average at 6.7%. And then there's those same values for us over that same time interval. So pretty much lockstep with what's happening both statewide and nationally on drinking water rates, and uh, considerably below what's uh, happening with our peers on the wastewater side. So that was percentage increases. Now this is looking at actual dollars. So this is looking uh, over a 20 year period of time at how our rates, which are highlighted there with the, the green solid line, compare to what's happening in Iowa for other communities. Um, this is looking at a subset of our survey data. It's communities greater than 10,000 population with Lyme softening. And so you can see 20 years ago, we were just a little above the statewide median. And since then we've can slowly, um, but consistently pulled a little bit farther and a little bit farther below the statewide median. So based on the 2022 statewide survey that we did, we're at the 26th percentile of that, that subgroup. Um, so that means 26% of the utilities are charging less than we are. 74% are charging more than we are for the same volume of water. 
how are we doing that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just great, John. <laughs> yes. It's, um, it's that conversation that you just heard about property taxes. It's, it's being responsible, mm -hmm. um, spending the money that we need to spend, not more than we need to spend. Sometimes the cheapest long-term solution is to spend more money now, um, but that, that's really what it is. Are each of those um, black marks, are those, is that a data point or is that like, what is that? Yeah, so the stack columns you see there, every one of those dots is what a utility in that survey was charging for 600 cubic feet of water in that year. So if you, you look at that, that series of stack dots over time, you can see how that envelope of rates moves and is stretching out. Um, and it's even more dramatic on the wastewater side. Um, and the 2022 survey, we were at the 21st percentile on sewer rates. Um, and it's interesting if you look kind of in the, the late 2010s, um, I believe that was Boone that was at the top because they had just completed a project. And then from 2011 to 2017, um, that was the city of Clinton that had the highest sewer rates because they were going through a major um, combined sewer separation project. Um, but since then, now you see there's one utility taking off that's Oskaloosa because they've been doing major wastewater projects. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the trend that you see is whoever's at the top is who's just done a big project recently. So that's an interesting point because we're going to be doing a 70 or $80 million plant help allay fears that aims will not be at that top data point. I'll show you that in just a second. So as we go to um, try to set the rates, there's a couple of guiding philosophies that we look at. Um, first, we need to make sure we're meeting our debt coverage requirements every year. And this is one of the attractive aspects of the state revolving fund is it does have a low debt coverage percentage that we have to maintain. Uh, we are trying to hit our target operating reserve. And about five years ago, we had that conversation with council. We were at 10% of our operating expenses and we're gradually trying to increase that by 1% a year to get to 25% of our annual operating expenses. Um, and then our goal is to do smaller percentage increases on a more frequent basis as opposed to going you know, 15 years with no rate, rate increase and then having to shock consumers with a, you know, 30, 40, 50% rate increase. So when we did that through this, this uh, budget round, this is the pattern of rate increases that came out of that. Um, you can see that water and sewer roughly equal magnitude increases that are needed um, offset every other year. So we're doing one utility or the other every year, but not doubling up for, for customers on the same fiscal year. And so with those rates um, then set into the rate model, this is what the fund balance would be projected to be over the next 10 years. So we're, we're recommending an 8% increase um, effective July of 23. Um, what you're seeing there, the, that kind of that purple colored bar, that's the ending balance in the fund each year. The yellow box, that's our target for the operating reserve. So the goal of the model is to try to make sure that that yellow box is filled every year. John, on that, um, are you presuming that the population of Ames is static or are you building into that model that we plan on growing. And so the number of potential rate payers, that pool goes up. Right. But there's also additional infrastructure costs that as we provide those services, there's also a, a, a burden to that. And right. so how do you think about both the expansion of our tax base and the cost of, of operating for a larger uh, population into the model like that? So the, the model the assumes question. that the uh, rate driven revenue will increase by about 0.6% per year. So that would be the, the population growth element. 
that's in there. Um, so that's that's our assumption over the, the next 10 years. As far as the so point six zero point six percent per year. And then the um, the infrastructure costs are captured in the, the CIP and the, on the expense side. So it's actual projects that we're estimating moving forward. So then just to land the plan on this. So as we're, if, if our population exceeds your, your model, then we should see greater fund balances. Am I saying that right? Correct. Okay. Thanks. Correct. Well, it's offset by increased costs. So. But in general, though, it helps to spread that that cost out. We're going to increase the pool. John, can you make that that slide one? Help people understand that giant purple bar. You got eighteen million dollars. Explain why adding rate increases if you got all this excess capital. Yeah, if we. If we would not do a rate increase, I actually looked at that this afternoon, we could go through the first four years of this 10-year plan and fully fund our target in the operating reserve. It's not until the fifth year that we would fall below that. But the rate of decline in that fund balance would be so steep at that point, we'd be looking at that 35-ish percent rate increase that would be needed. And so the the longstanding approach is that it's easier for consumers if we nudge the rates just a little bit at a time, as opposed to kind of skating for four or five years and then doing that big massive increase. So what happens in 33, 34? Does, I, does the rate increase equal what you need and so you're gonna have, basically it's gonna look the same going forward or? I would think that's probably a reasonable assumption. Um, we do try to put together an actual capital project plan that goes out 10 years, even though you only approve a five-year CIP. Um, but when you start getting out to those later years, it starts becoming a whole lot more subjective as to exactly what those capital needs are going to be. So um, that's also a part of the reason that historically council has only approved rates one year at a time. So you're, you're seeing the plan, you know which direction we're heading, but you don't try to lock in too early so that you leave that flexibility for what the future might hold. And that the ending fund balance is being used for projects at the plant, is that correct? Or is it strictly for operations? No, that would be for, for both, for both operations and for capital projects. So the point is that we have, it may look like we have a lot of money, but there are capital improvement projects that are programmed in that need to be done like the well project that we're doing right now or other things. Is that correct? Yeah. That's all. Those are all built in here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just, as a person who may not be in understanding of it, I say, well, gee, why are you, <laughs> you're collecting all that extra money? Why are you doing that? Well, the point is that is being used to help pay for improvements. And we're trying to keep it very simple and very uh, uniform. Again, like we're doing our budgeting, <laughs> trying to keep it very, um, not flat line, but as modest as we can for our exactly. for our customers, um, no matter what it is, whether it's water, sewer, or property taxes. Our economic development strategy is tied to this too. And you were talking about is it good if we have more population and it spreads the cost? But we want to be careful not to bring in an industry that maybe employs fifty people, but it uses uh, one third of our capacity as increased for it. That'll force us to make some substantial capital improvements. Mm -hmm which uh, will affect all of us, you know what I mean? There's not a lot of employment, big use. And that's the same thing as electric too, right? There's this tipping point, you have to do kind of cost benefit. It's a sustainability issue, but it is an economic issue too. And that's why uh, our economic development people don't always, don't always like us because they'll bring somebody in and we'll say, we don't think we can justify it. It's too big of a user, either water, sewer, electric for 50 employees again. Mm -hmm. And um, that's up to you, of course, but that's been our economic uh, stra economic development strategy that relates to uh, utilities. That's helpful. So one last comparison I wanted to share, and that's what it actually looks like on a customer's bill. 
So this is for a theoretical median customer. So someone using 600 kilowatt hours of energy and 600 cubic feet of water and sewer. Um, the increase, so this, this uh, in red here, the $2.29, that would be the increase for the water portion. But when you look at that across an entire um, customer's utility bill, the impact that a customer is seeing is just a little over one and a half percent total on their their city utility bill. And uh, just as we were commenting before, given the way the world is moving around us and prices are moving, that should be a point of pride for oh, the Ames community that we're holding the rates like that. So our recommendation is that you approve an adjustment to water rates by 8%, and that would be effective for bills that are mailed on or after July 1st. Um, the timeline is kind of important. Um, you approve it tonight on first reading, second reading, and third reading on May 23rd. And the reason I say that's important is because the water consumption that will be billed at that higher rate will start in June. The bills will be mailed on July 1st, but the consumption will start in June. So this timeline allows the rates to be fully adopted before people use any water at that higher rate. So they're fully aware of the rate. And with that, Mayor, I would turn it back to you. Thank you. Just to recall, the budget we presented to you in February incorporates the 8% already built in. So you've appropriated the funds. Now we're seeking your direction or approval to go ahead and establish the actual rates, which will start the charge, as John mentioned, so. All right, open up public input. Is anyone that wants to address council on the proposed increase in water rates? Seeing none, we'll close public input. And uh, just before I go to reading, I, I just, just proud to be associated <laughs> with the city and what you guys are doing in terms of, I wish there's certain people at the state house that could sit through a presentation like this and understand the amount of work and effort that goes into trying to operate in a very efficient, cost-effective manner and let people know what we're, you know, what we're doing. I just think it's, uh, I just think you, staff does an outstanding job and you're to be commended and thanks for the presentation. It makes it very simple to understand as well too. So Thank you. With that, entertain a motion on first reading an ordinance to increase water rates by 8% effective for bills mailed out on or after July 1, 2023. So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 Thank you, John. All right, entertain a motion uh, on third reading and adoption of ordinance number 4499 to amend the Ames Municipal Code sections 18.31, paragraph 32, and 343 regulating parking on Bristol Drive and Hampton Street. Move on third. Second. Thank you. Roll call. Aye. 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 All right, we'll move on to disposition to communications from council. We have uh, first is a memo from Sarah Van Metren on homeowner permits. Uh, I think this is just in response to some questions. No, uh, you asked, asked, there was a, Mr. Satterwhite, Satterwhite had um, identified a number of questions for you on these two issues and you asked for a memo to clarify on each one of those items, fire blocking and also requirement on permits from homeowners or third party or work on third um, on rental units. So we gave you that for information, no actions required. Unless you wanted to make, bring us up or place on a future agenda. Oh, hearing none, we'll just take it under advisement. Number three and four relative to uh, housing kind of ties in with item number five. Um, that's why I asked council to defer three and four to number five. Might be good if you refer to us for a memo, kind of see how we would envision this happening in what format. I would move for such a memo. Second. Okay, those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 
Any opposed? Aye. Oh, I, Amber said yes. I was, was too too fast. Sorry, Amber. All right. Uh, next is an email from Jay Venice or Venas. I'm sorry, Jay. Um, I have butchered your name. Adams regarding traffic improvements in Campus Town and West Ames. And we refer to staff, staff for a memo. For a memo. Yep. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Good and second for a memo from staff. Those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed or abstaining? And number seven, we have an email from Sandy Swanson regarding a uh, parking code requirements. Sorry. Move for a memo from staff on this one as well. Is there a second? second? There's a move and seconded. Those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. All right. Um, I would like to take the privilege of offering council comments first. And I just want to commend uh, our city manager who received an ISU award recognizing dedication to public service. And those who know Steve know that uh, that is one of his highest, if not the highest, you know, passion of yours. And uh, for those of us who have noticed the plaque, he's just basically downplays it and says, ah, it's no big deal. Well, I think it's a big deal. And we just want to commend you, Steve, for that. Um, and, uh, and also just the fact that ISU faculty nominated you and uh, or approved it as well, too. So congratulations. Uh, Well-deserved. So I'd ask for I'd ask for a speech, but I know I won't get one. No. <laughs> All right. All right. Amber, anything for you tonight? No thanks. Gloria. Um well I I would just say congratulations, Steve, and that was the Dwight Inc. Public Service Award for those people who might be tracking what the award was. Um Apparently, he was an alumnus of Iowa State. He was. Um, we heard during public forum about the challenges that are being faced some of, by some of the residents down and especially down in the Southdale area um, because of the South 16th Street construction that's going on. And... I am not really sure what the correct motion would be here, but it seems like I, I, we might have public works look into this. What I didn't understand was it focused on, <clears throat> he said to meet with Syri. I believe that was uh, a suggestion for an alternative and a way that it might be addressed, I think, by extending the Syri. On-demand service. Yeah. Pardon me? The on-demand um, service. But it, is that the solution you're but looking for? I, Why? No, I, mean, I, I just want it to be looked into yeah. so that we can see if there's there's something that can be done to improve the situation. Uh, and this this situation, and it would be good to think about for future yes. construction of that magnitude, how we might proactively... Mm -hmm. uh, think through such road closures, I guess. Are you going to make that motion since you just said it? No, I mean, you, but I, in, I can try it. But in fairness, I mean, I think we do this already. Um, I think we would. And, and I, I beg to differ uh, with the speaker on this. I, I think we, whenever we have a major project like this, we look at the impacts on traffic flow. I, 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 I don't I mean, know. But a three and a half mile bike detour is not a minimal detour. Um, so I think that there is a possibility that we could do something more, even if we've looked into it previously. I know since this project is being done in stages, it might just be that this stage is a lot worse, but I think it's worth looking into to see if we could improve accessibility at all. So that's what I want to focus on the bike detours at the issue. Bike and pedestrian detours. Did you make a motion then? Um, yeah, I would move that we have staff look into the bike and pedestrian detours with the South 16th construction project and see if anything can be done to improve accessibility. Second. Okay. So could you clarify, I am struggling with this because I, I think we're already doing this. 
I think if John were here, he would say that's what the process involves. What, what more could we do? I, I would say that it sounds like it's not working, whatever is being done currently, but I don't know what's being done. So I think that's why we have staff look into it. We had the same situation when there was construction of that other intersection down there on South Duff when we rearranged Billy Sunday Road. Mm -hmm. The residents of Southdale were having difficulties with the bike and pedestrian corridor. And I think Public Works looked into that and made some recommendations. And I, I don't see a reason not to do the same thing here. I, I, don't, don't, I don't mind looking at it. I mean, I'm sure they looked at it, and I'm not sure if we have any better solutions, but we can, we can certainly challenge to do it. And if we can't do it, you deserve to know why, what, what we thought about and what can be done. But you're focusing on, I just want to make sure, the uh, bike and pedestrian detours. That's what you're concerned about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think improving accessibility maybe if there's nothing to be done with bike and pedestrian detours we could maybe look at side ride later but that wouldn't be my focus to start off okay. with mm -hmm. because pedestrians and biking is the original transport form for people trying to get through that camp right yeah, that's now. good to know that was good and i appreciate the challenge but it's just the nature of a, of a project like this it just wipes everything out and they're just you know i I think we've got a public works department over my tenure here has done a phenomenal job of trying to accommodate the public in the midst of major constructions. I, I'm nervous. Where the, I don't know if this is a any merit to this, but. Those who have the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Anything and, else? Um, no, I don't have anything else. Thank you. Tim? One of my favorite events in Ames is coming up this weekend, and it is Stash the Trash. So um, this is an opportunity for neighborhoods, for organizations to spread out and clean up this community. There are lots of places that um, have a lot of garbage, and this is an opportunity to give back. It doesn't take a lot. And if people have uh, questions on this, there's information on the web uh, easily. Um, my running group will be conducting some plogging, which is the Swedish word for running and picking up trash at the same time. So we will be plogging on Saturday. So pick up your neighborhood. Thanks. Anita? Um, also on Saturday will be the first uh, free yard waste day. So um, there are usually student groups that are out there assisting. Uh, I greatly appreciate them. And so um, it's that time of year. Mm -hmm. Um, another event on Saturday, there's a ribbon cutting for our two new battery electric buses at SciRide. Um, you can take one of the electric buses from City Hall on that day, 11 a.m. to 12.30, and then the ribbon cutting will be at noon at SciRide. I wish I had an event to find. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Nothing for me. Oh, um, thanks for having me this week. Tabitha will be back at the next meeting. Hopefully her bill goes up for confirmation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and then I am my president and we're beginning Cyclone Welcome Weekend planning and stuff at the university. So if you have any questions about that moving forward, feel free to let me know. Thank you. Well, you chose a good meeting to come to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. Those in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.